Silent Witch Fall 6, Elective Course Arc. V6 C1, a refined solo game of Maid Who've Got So Many Spare Time as Earth GT Silent Witch June 15, 2021 6 minutes it had been a week since Monica had been recuperating in Isabel's room. Now her physical condition has improved, she decided to return to her room in the attic as before. Why not continue to stay in her room, so Isabel suggested, but Monica refused since she was carrying out a secret mission. Let's go, Monica. I'll lead the way. Follow me when I give the signal, yeah. Nero went ahead to make sure no one was around, and when he gave the signal, Monica crept her way across the corridor. At night in the girls' dormitory, several supervisors would take turns keeping watch around. In the pretense of emergencies or intruders, but in reality, it's to keep an eye on the students who are planning to have a night out. Monica asked Nero to keep an eye out for her to avoid being spotted as she carefully made her way to the attic. She's almost got caught a few times on her way there, but thanks to Nero, she made it to reach the attic without being spotted, then climbed up the old ladder to the top and pushed up the door. Then, she heard a clacking sound. The door hit something when she pushed it up, it was a small, thin, rectangular piece of wood. The wooden pieces arranged at equal intervals were placed in such a way that their tips would collide with each other when the door pushed up. After Monica opened up the door, the evenly spaced pieces of wood dropped one after another following by clicking sounds. At the end of it stood a quill pen that was propped up against the ink pot, barely vertical. As the quill was pushed down by the piece of wood, the tip of the quill grazed the top of a can set up nearby. The round stone that was placed on top of the can was sliding across the measuring stick like a slide. At the end of the way down was one tip of the scales of the balance. When a pebble fell on it, the scale tilted, and on the top of the lifted scale was a piece of paper that said goal written on. A distracting whistle sound came from above the stunned Monica and Nero. Toot toot, toot toot, toot toot. As they looked up, they saw a beautiful woman in a maid uniform, Lewis Miller's contracted spirit, Lynn, standing inside the attic looking down expressionlessly at Monica and her group coming up, with a flute in her mouth. Lynn swooped down to the floor in a weightless motion, picked up the hem of her skirt, and bowed gracefully. Welcome back, Miss, Silent Witch, Sir Black Cat, um, Miss, Lynn, indeed. This one is the very contracted high spirit of Lewis Miller, Lynn Bergfield, spoke the beautiful doll-like expressionless face with the usual indifferent voice. And yet, the flute in her mouth stood out in contrast to her action. How does she vocalize her voice? Nero seemed to be curious about the trick that was triggered when the door opened, and when he saw how the pieces of wood set up, he was impressed and said, Wow, this is amazing. In response, Lynn expressionlessly nodded somewhat proud. This is a huge work that took me 2,174 failed attempts and 62 hours of work, including gathering materials. It was not easy to cut these pieces of wood to the same size, um, what's this, for, said Monica after managed to squeeze her words, which was responded by Lynn with a serious tone. It was approximately 72 hours ago when I arrived in this room to receive the regular report. The task of waiting for your return in this place has left me so bored. In other words, Lynn had been waiting for Monica in this attic for three days, while diligently scraping and arranging pieces of wood. As Monica paled at the guilt she had felt after leaving her for so long, Nero spoke up in exasperation. Don't let her words fool you, Monica. Spirits wouldn't get bored in just three days. Their sense of time was different from humans. Now that you mention it, you're right, I suppose, Nero, who had tasted the deliciousness of human food and the enjoyment of novels ever since became her familiar, nodded in agreement. After quickly cleaned up the pieces of wood scattered on the floor, Lynn looked at Monica as if she has finally remembered her main objective. So, where have you been for the past few days? Well, I apologize for that, for the past week. 
I've been staying in Lady Isabel's room. After being poisoned, I've been recuperating there, as Monica fidgeting her finger trying to explain her circumstance, Lynn bent her head to the side. She's probably trying to tilt her head, but what she's done looked so creepy. I wonder how could you, the silent witch, who should escort his highness, be poisoned, I would like to know too, she also wanted to know the answer. Recalling her recent event for the past month and a half, she's become a member of the student council as soon as she transferred to the school, having her tea leaves dumped on her during the tea ceremony class, and was nearly poisoned by a classmate. I have heard that there will be a school festival next month, well, yes, yeah, since many outsiders will be coming in, the attempts to assassinate the second prince will be increased too. Sir Lewis also left some advice, please keep your guard up, I I will, Monica steeled her resolve once again. That's right, her recent surrounding events had made her forgot that Felix's life has always been surrounded by danger. As Monica thought, I have to pull myself together, in her mind, Nero looked up nudged at her. I've been thinking this for a while. If you want to assassinate the prince, why don't you just fire a large magic weapon at this school? Wouldn't that be easier, Nero, if you do that, it wouldn't be called assassination anymore, if they really plan to do that on that scale, it would like to be declaring war. That thought recalled back her memories when Lewis told her about some of his stories. I think you don't have to worry about people attacking from the outside. After all, this school had been protected by a barrier covering around, is that so, it is. And most of the major facilities in this kingdom have been protected by the barrier created by Lewis, dot. Lewis Miller has another alias which was the, Barrier Magician. Although he's widely known for his martial artist, his specialty was creating a barrier. Its strength, scale, precision, and duration said to be unrivaled by anyone. And that Lewis has put a lot of effort and time into a large-scale barrier that covered this school. Comma I think he set up a barrier for defense then combined it with a detection magic formula. Usually, it would remain in a dormant state, but when it detects an attack from the outside, the barrier would activate. As long as we have Lewis's barrier, an attack from the outside would be the last thing to concern about, for that reason. The thing she should worry about was an assassination from the inside. The barrier that Lewis set up can defend against an attack from the outside, but it can't do anything to the things that happened inside. I need to act more carefully, as Monica told herself so. I guess we need to think of a plan during the school festival. Lynn, could you wait for a moment? I will write the regular report now, as Monica turned to her desk, picked up her quill. Lynn clapped her hands together as if she had remembered something, and began rummaging through the pockets of her mage uniform. Miss, Silent Witch, while you were away, a few secret letters had arrived in this attic. Secret letters, yes, since it had been slipped in between the gaps of the door, I was able to retrieve it. Here, what Lynn presented to her was a simple piece of paper folded in half leaving her body to stiffen as the nervousness growing up. She recalled the thing that happened a long time ago before she enrolled into Minerva, where some ill words written on the letters slipped into her room. Such horrible words like go to hell or get out from Minerva. Imagining such thoughts, Monica unfolded the paper with her trembling fingers. Come on, what's written there was the change of her period class and the things that should be brought in which shaped in rounded fonts. And it ended with one sentence of you should get better quickly, although there's no name on it, from the handwritings, she knew the senders, and it was Lana. Looking at the number sheets of the papers, she speculated Lana had sent one letter every day for the past week. And the letter that arrived recently has there will be course selection in the school tomorrow, so you must come for sure written on. Monica couldn't help but raise her mouth as she covered her red face with both hands. Comma Aha, after rereading the letters one by one carefully, she put them inside her drawer, where she had put her precious coffee pot in, then locked it. V6C2, 
the first debut of Silent Witch at Cafeteria Azareth GT Silent Witch June 18, 2021 Six minutes after returning from her recuperation, she's been attending the class for a whole week, and for the first time, she was going to eat her lunch at the cafeteria. Since Casey, who from the next class, had taken the trouble inviting Monica to have lunch together and Lan is also going to tag along, Monica nervously accepted her invitation with a nod. Speaking of the school cafeteria, all she could remember was the school cafeteria at Magician Training Institute Minerva where she's been enrolled into. Minerva had a system where the students choose the menu at the reception desk to get a wooden tag after paying the bill up front which later brought to the counter to exchange for a meal of the chosen menu. The menu selections changed daily by three different sets of meals, and additional bread and soup were available for an extra charge. As such, she thought that the cafeteria at Sarandia Academy would also have such a system, but it was very different from what she had imagined. To put it simply, the school cafeteria of Sarandia Academy was a high-class restaurant. Once the students stepped into the cafeteria, they would be guided by waiters into seats, given a brief explanation on the menu, and had their meals brought onto their table. The students were not required to pay, since all of the cost has been included in the school fees. The best thing was one could even request their meals delivered directly to their own room in the dorm. T this is so amazing. Even at Minerva where Monica's enrolled which many of the students came from nobilities had provided many facilities, it still can't be compared to what Sarandia Academy had. Everything here looked so extravagant. Monica felt restless at the unused cafeteria while being escorted by the waiters to her seat before quietly sat down next to someone. She's been looking down until now, so she thought the ones who sat at the table were only Lana and Casey. But when she raised her face, she saw them sat across the table. Then, who's the person sat next to her? Awkwardly turning her head, she met the gaze of Claudia Ashley's beautiful blue lapis lazuli eyes. Wait, why are you sitting there too? Lana yelled at Claudia in angry, but only to be brushed nonchalantly before Claudia's getting closer to Monica. Comma oh my, aren't we friends, Monica? Monica's whole body stiffened as she let out faint voices. Claudia stroked Monica's cheek with her white glove fingertips. For some reason, she felt as if a snake was crawling on her skin. Comma Monica, I did save your life, didn't I? Why you did, you do appreciate what I did for you, don't you? I I do, then we're friends, aren't we? Why yeah, after a convinced the stiffly nodding Monica to agree. Claudia smiled triumphantly, while Lana's vein propped up on her forehead. That's just coercing, and Casey was now, now tried to calm down the angry Lana. Come on, let's stop this edgy atmosphere and talk more calmly, shall we? Oh, please, I don't intend to make the atmosphere this edgy. It's just the girl over there making a fuss all by herself, right? Lana gritted her teeth at Claudia's obviously provocative tone. Casey looked at them both in turn with an exasperated expression. You too, please let Monica choose her own food. Oh, Monica. I recommend this fried fish. It comes with a delicious special sauce. Also, this and this, to tell the truth, Monica, who earned a good income as a seventh sage, was not troubled by money. Therefore. She didn't mind any of the dishes on the menu. In fact, since she didn't know much about food, she would be very grateful if someone could recommend something for her. When everyone had finished ordering, Casey opened his mouth to mediate the delicate atmosphere. Say, we are going to observe the elective course this afternoon, right? Have you guys decided which course you want to take yet, since the start of the second year of high school? The students could take elective courses in addition to the regular basic courses. Among more than 20 courses, they can choose two to take. Horseback riding, sword fighting, and spear fighting were popular among boys. Musical performance, embroidery, and poetry were popular among girls. Other courses such as sociology, herbology, 
and foreign languages were also available for both boys and girls. With such a wide variety of courses to choose from, Monica still hadn't decided which one she wanted to take. It would have been nice to have something like advanced mathematics, but there was only basic math in the academic subjects. As Monica clammed up, Lana opened her mouth. I would perhaps choose musical performance course, but considering my future, I would also like to learn two languages. Maybe if I learn some languages, especially Southern Continent Commercial and Alka, I could be useful for my father's work. How wonderful. I think I'll go for embroidery. That's the only thing I'm good at. I'll hold off on the other one. What about you, Miss Claudia? Casey casually swung the conversation to Claudia, and Claudia said with a gloomy smile on her beautiful face. Herbology and basic spell casting might come in handy to shut those idiots up, don't you think? Casey hoped Claudia doesn't say things like that with an evil smile, as if having already poisoned a few people. As for Monica, who was saved by Claudia's emergency treatment a week ago, she couldn't say anything about it. Have you decided yet, Monica, asked by Lana. Monica was stuck for words. Serendia Academy offered a strong curriculum in languages, law, and liberal arts, but was somewhat weak in areas such as advanced mathematics, physics, and biology. In other words, subjects in which Monica excels were few and far between. When it comes to basic spells casting, she definitely excelled at it. I can't even say that my magic formula is listed in a basic spells textbook. Being too good at magic-related matters, on the other hand, would likely get her into trouble. Comma I haven't, decided, at all, yet, Monica answered while kneading her fingers, which made Casey grin. So, how about you come with me to look around the courses? I haven't decided on one yet, and hopefully... I could get to know some new courses that I wouldn't normally encounter. Please guide me well. When it came to observing the courses, it was natural that she would run into a group of people she had never met before. For Monica, who was very uncomfortable with this, Casey's offer was very much appreciated. As she patted her chest in relief, the waiter brought the meal to her. In front of Monica was a beautifully colored fried fish, salad, bread and soup lined on her table. Casey, who ordered the same thing, split the bread in two with a beaming face, put the vegetables and fries between them, and took a big bite. When Claudia saw the way she was eating, her brow furrowed. Comma that is how the laborers eat, at home, we all eat like this. When we took rest after farming, Casey didn't care if Claudia looked dumbfounded or not. That kind of strength to not care about the eyes of the people around her was something Monica envied. Casey gulped down a piece of bread and wiped her mouth with a napkin before saying, Besides, in my hometown, nobles and workers are equal. We all have to work together to get food. So, how did you end up at this school? I don't mind if you say, how could a poor aristocrat pay for school in fact? That's what I think. Instead of being menial, Casey spoke casually. She probably didn't think of her circumstances as unfortunate. I was really lucky to get into Serendia Academy. A kind person with whom we have a connection has offered to help us. My father says I should go and meet His Highness, but... You know, I'm sure your father will tell you this at least once. Like go catch His Highness eye or something. Claudia and Lana shook their heads at Casey's blurting. Comma I have a fiancé, my father was like, what if my pretty Lana catches his highness I will, it's unlikely, isn't it? At their words, Casey muttered, I envy you, and then glanced at Monica. What about you, Monica, oh, the, has anyone ever told you that? That you should catch the attention of his highness, Monica was at a loss for words. If anything, it was Monica's duty to escort His Highness. Well, uh, I'm afraid so. Barely answering that, Casey didn't seem to be particularly bothered by it and gave an I.C., and then took another bite of bread. These six C3, 
Monotest Azareth GT Tired Immortal June 20, 2021 10 minutes normally. The elective courses at Serendia Academy are conducted by all three grades. However, only the third-year students were given elective courses at the beginning of the new semester, about a month and a half earlier than the first and second-year students. Today's observation tour will mainly consist of freshmen and sophomores freely observing the classroom of third graders. Since Lana and Claudia had already decided on the course they wanted to take, they each went off to observe their own courses. Monica, who hasn't decided on one yet, was in the middle of touring each classroom with Casey, who had invited her to join her during lunch. As she walked, Monica looked over the handouts she had been given in advance. Reading it over again, she was amazed at the variety of courses offered. At Minerva, where she used to enroll, had all courses related to magic except for the basic education courses, so she had never had to worry about this much. As Monica nodded in understanding, Casey, walking next to her, opened her mouth. I guess swordsmanship and equestrian courses are the most popular among boys. Especially with equestrian, since there are only so many horses available, it's often going to end up in a lottery. To tell you the truth, I took the equestrian course last year, too. And I was lucky enough to win the lottery, while you're able to ride a horse, Casey, as Monica rounded her eyes, Casey brushed it with a laugh as if it was no big deal. All the men and women in my hometown knew to ride a horse. I used to accompany my father on his long rides. I even joined him on a hunt sometimes with my crossbow, for a wealthy noble. Hunting was just another form of entertainment. But to Casey, it's one way of earning a living. Casey was amazing, Monica thought honestly. She was energetic and capable of doing things. She was also good at cooking and embroidery. In her hometown, she used to do embroideries on days when the weather was bad and sell them to make a living. Even without a maidservant. She had no difficulty in taking care of herself and had a good capability for living. As Monica looked up at Casey with admiration, Casey scratched her head uncomfortably. This kind of unladylike gesture was really a part of her. Aw, oh, please stop complimenting me like that, it's really embarrassing. I am not that great at all. We've always been poor because our land often heavily damaged by dragons. So we couldn't eat unless we've got skills like that, b but you're able to keep up your grades, on general academic courses, whether it was tea party class or ballroom dancing class, Casey's grades were never bad. It was a far cry from Monica's almost catastrophic grades in everything but math. No, I'm just know all of them a bit, haha, <laughs> Casey gave a wry laugh before glancing at the handout in Monica's hand. But now that I have the opportunity to enroll at Serendia Academy, I'd like to learn things that I can't learn back home. For example, is this course, Casey then pointed to the text in the handout. Looking at the words, Monica rounded her eyes. Casey pointed to the practical magic course. I'm a little curious about practicing magic myself. In my hometown, we rarely see magicians. Are you interested in it? Monica, huh? Knew you, I just, if anything, Monica was actually one of the best magicians in the kingdom, one of the seven sages, the silent witch. Of course, there is no way she could tell her that. If Monica was an ordinary magician, she would have been able to take practical magic courses without hiding her true identity. However, Monica has a fatal flaw. Monica, who can't chant properly in public, can chant normally, in other words, she can only use the no chance spell. And the moment she uses a no chance spell, Monica's true identity will be revealed. Because Monica was the only person in the world who could use a no chance spell. I I I I don't think I'm cut out for magic, so, is that so? You never know until you try. Wait, Monica, you look really pale, are you okay? that's no not tr true now you're just gonna let it roll off your tongue casey put her hands on her hips and gave her an exasperated look 
Then her eyes suddenly widened. Her gaze was not focused on Monica, but the person behind her. Hello, Miss Norton. How are you feeling now? It was impossible to mishear his soft and gentle voice. Like a squeaky old spring, Monica turned around to see Felix smiling at her with a dignified smile. Why your... Your Highness, yeah, it's been a while since I've heard that amusing phrase, A eh, about tea that matter, I, I am thrilledly grateful, for your help, thrilledly. In response to Monica's unusual comment, Felix covered his mouth with his hand as he quivered. On the other hand, Casey's face stiffened and became rigid. He was the second prince that everyone adored, but being in a different grade, it was not often had the chance to meet in such close proximity, so her reaction was only natural. Still paying attention to Casey, Monica asked him stiffly. You um. W why are you here? Why your highness, some of the third year students are helping to guide the first and second year students on their observation visits. Have you picked your elective courses yet, by any chance? When Monica was shaking her head. Felix said, oh, that's a relief, and smiled cheerfully. She had a very bad feeling about this. Whenever His Highness was in a good mood, Monica would usually end up in a bad situation. I think I have a course that might be suitable for you. Allow me to show you around. Your friend can tag along, she has especially a bad feeling about this. She had nothing but a bad feeling. However, since Felix had invited her out, there was no way Monica could refuse. The already stiff-faced Casey replied, I it's my pleasure, if she knew this was going to happen, she might have just picked embroidery or musical performance at that time. Inwardly holding her head up, Monica followed Felix helplessly. We've arrived, this was the very classroom that Felix had led her to. When Monica saw the sign on the door, she bawled her eyes out. Maybe her eyes had gone a little white, maybe her heart had almost stopped. Practical magic, it was the worst course that Monica could have chosen. To Monica, who was shaking all over, Felix said with an oddly amused look. I haven't taken this particular course, but I think you might be well suited for magic. W what made you think TT that way? What made him think that way? Felix answered Monica's sluggish question with a simple answer. It's said that the more math-oriented one is, the better one is at magic. You've got an outstanding grade in mathematics, don't you? So I figured you'd be good at it, that's exactly right. Monica's ability to calculate has allowed her to create numerous new magic formulas and mastered the art of no-chance spells. However, Monica absolutely could not allow herself to pick this course. How can I find an excuse to leave this place? As she pondered this, Felix opened the door to the classroom and called out to the teacher standing at the podium. Professor MacRigan, I've brought two candidates who wish to observe them. The teacher standing at the podium slowly turned around to look at their way. He was a small old man with thick white eyebrows and a long beard that hid his eyes and mouth. Monica recognized him. While Monica turned pale and Casey looked curious, Felix said cheerfully, This is Professor MacRigan, the teacher in this practical magic course. Until a few years ago, he was a teacher at the most prestigious magician training institute, Minerva, P. Professor MacRigan? MacRigan was the teacher who had taught Monica magic when she was a student at Minerva. Naturally, they were acquainted. She had heard that MacRigan had retired from Minerva at about the same time Monica was graduating, but she never imagined that he was teaching here. The words mission failed raced through Monica's head. I it's over, the whole thing's been exposed. As Monica stood there looking like a dead man, MacRigan said in a tone that was rather cute for his age. Kama Horchiru, I'm Felix R. Gridile, the student council president. Oh, so you're that student council president? Yeah, thanks for bringing him here. Uh, are you two the visitors? I'm sorry, but I don't have very good eyesight. Are two boys or girls? Both of them are girls. Ah, so they're girls. Yes, yes, 
More girls are taking this course these days. His tone was cute for his age, and he spoke uniquely, referring to other people as Chu instead of you, just as Monica remembered. And also, the fact that he has trouble seeing. Maybe, H he hasn't noticed? I still have a chance. I can still escape now. To begin with, Monica came to this school not as Monica Everett but Monica Norton, unless someone called her by her first name out loud. It was unlikely that she would be recognized as the same person. Ah. Is that you, Monica? Are you picking a practical magic course too, Monica? Monica's head went total blank for a few seconds. As Monica came to her senses, she was approached by Glenn Dudley, who was in high spirits today, and Neil Clay Maywood, another student council member. Neil greeted Felix politely when he caught sight of him. Hello, President. And Miss Norton too. Are you all going to be picking this course? Felix shook his head at Neil's words. Unfortunately, I have not taken it, but I thought it might be suitable for Miss Norton, so I was showing her and her friend around. What? Really? I can barely manage counting two-digit addition. Maybe I'm just not very good at it. The fact that Glenn had also come to this classroom meant that he was planning to pick a practical magic course. That reminds me, Glenn, is an apprentice magician, I think? Glenn has performed his flying magic several times in front of Monica. It's not an easy technique, so Glenn must have some talent. As Monica was thinking about this, MacRigan cleared his throat. Ahem, don't stand there talking at the entrance. Please come and take your seat. Also, on the subject of what makes someone is suitable to become a magician and what doesn't, I'll explain it to you so that it's easier for the other students to understand. MacRigan urged Monica and the others to sit down at an empty seat. Even Felix, who was not a candidate, sat down next to Monica with an amused look on his face. She hoped that he could back to his job of showing the students around as quickly as possible. Okay, ahem. First of all, to become a magician, all you need is these three talents. It's amount of mana, ability to comprehend magic formulas, and skill to manipulate mana. Macrigan wrote the three aspects he had just mentioned on the blackboard and circled the words the quantity of mana first. Whatever you say, the most important talent is the amount of your mana. Without it, you couldn't cast any spells in the first place. Nowadays, it's easy to measure with the mana measuring tool, but to be an apprentice, you need to have about 50 points of mana. Over 100 is pretty good, over 150 and you could become one of the seven sages. When he mentioned the word of seven sages, Monica's heart jumped again. Oh, how bad for the heart. Next is ability to comprehend magic formulas. Magic formula is like mathematical equations. As Chu Wall said earlier, this is the reason why children who excel in mathematics are suitable for magicians. The magic formula is the blueprint and framework of magic, that is. The more you comprehend the magic formula correctly, the more accurate your magic will be. It was what the silent witch had said, though, Monica Shriek internally oh, incidentally, many of magic formulas that silent witch created often appear on written tests, so keep that in mind, please don't keep that in your mind. Well, it's no exaggeration to say that she's an amazing magician that turned the theory of modern magic upside down, that's an exaggeration. Please stop with that praise. Monica's complexion was no longer pale, but ashen. She would like to escape from this place right now if she could. Next to her, Casey whispered, Monica. Are you okay but Monica could only give a small nod with a strained smile on her face. Finally, skill to manipulate mana. This refers to the process of weaving mana based on a magic formula, and it requires a great deal of sense. A girl with excellent sense can effortlessly turn mana into a spell, while a girl with poor sense will always end up losing her mana. In many cases, a child can use spells to some extent even if their understanding of the magic formula is low if he has excellent skill to manipulate mana. In crafting, 
Even with a rough blueprint and framework, you can still create some kind of form. Well, you can't expect a good product out of it. Perhaps Glenn was that type of person. Even if this type of person does not have a good comprehension of magic formulas, they can formulate a spell to a certain extent with their natural sense. Well, it's preferable to have all three of these talents. The basic premise is that you can't use magic if you don't have mana. All the students who want to take this class have to have their mana measured. Macrigan then placed an armful ornament on the podium. It was a metal base with a clear crystal ball on it. The pedestal has a number scale from 0 to 250 on it. This is called a mana measuring tool, and if you put your hand on this crystal ball, it can easily measure your mana. Here, just like this, when Macrigan placed his hand on the crystal ball, the crystal ball glowed a pale blue, and the number on the scale moved to 158. His mana numbered 158, he's unquestionably at an advanced magician level. My mana is 158, with blue light, so my best attribute is water. You can easily find out what your mana is like. Pretty impressive, isn't it? Okay, you two, take turns touching it, do I have two? Monica's heart beat fast with an unpleasant sound. The general guideline for the quantity of mana is as follows. 149 is for ordinary people with no talent, 1599 is for apprentices and low-level magicians, 100 149 is for intermediate magicians, and 150 and above is for advanced magicians. Over 200 is rarely seen. And since seven sages are required to have mana of 150 or more, they must be measured once a year. Therefore, Monica knew exactly how much mana she had. And my last measurement was 202. Since the amount of mana grows at its peak in the latter half of the teenage years, there is a possibility that it may have increased even more if things went badly. And having mana over 200 was not a common number by all accounts. WWWWW What should I do? Monica shuddered as her whole body was drenched in cold sweats. V6C4, War Simulation Azeroth GT Silent Witch June 22, 2021 6 minutes There is an all-purpose excuse that is always used when one wants to escape from certain situations. Comma which is, I need to go to the bathroom, however, not everyone is comfortable with this all-purpose excuse. For those who are extremely shy, even speaking out in public is a hurdle. So Monica remained rigid in her seat, trying to say this all-purpose excuse, only end with her mouth shut, and then open it again, and then close it all over again. I'll say it this time, I'll say it next time, I'll say it when there's good timing in the conversation, I wonder when good timing is, I'll say it anyway, I'll say it, I'll say it this time, this time. In the meantime, the mana measuring tool slowly came closer and closer to Monica. Currently, it was Casey's and Neil's turn to put their hands on the crystal. If she touches that thing, it will be the end for Monica. And they'll know she's not an ordinary person. Hmm, my strongest attribute is fire, and my magic power is 52, not so great. It is said that the more magic you use in your youth, the more your mana will grow and it may grow in the future, after Casey, it was Neil's turn to touch the crystal. Neil's results showed that his strongest attribute was Earth, and his mana was 96, which was not a bad number. Felix admiringly remarked Neil. Young Maywood, you've never used magic before, have you? Yes, I've only learned a little bit in my class. I heard that my father can use it quite well, well. The Maywood family has been good at earth magic for many generations, now. Now is the time to say, I need to go to the bathroom, but, with this timing, won't they think I'm interrupting his highness speech? It's my turn now, said Glenn cheerfully and took off his gloves. Wah, once Glenn's done with his turn, I'll be next. I have to get out of here before that happens. As she was holding her head and sweating heavily. She heard a snapping sound right next to her. 
Wire creaking sound. The sound came from the mana measuring tool in Glenn's hand. A portion of the crystal ball where Glenn's hand was touching was glowing red, revealing a small crack in it. Oh no, Glenn exclaimed, and the next moment, a large crack appeared in the crystal ball. Glenn hurriedly took his hand away from the measuring tool. Professor. This thing's broken, no way. How much do you think that thing costs? No, no, it's not my fault. It must be defective. It's defective. The glowing red in the crystal indicated that Glenn's strongest attribute was fire. The problem was the amount of his mana. The scale indicating his mana was completely overflowing to the very end. The maximum value of that instrument was 250, which meant that Glenn's mana exceeded 250. But how's that possible? Within the kingdom, there were only a handful of people whose mana exceeds 250. Even among the seven sages, only two people have that much mana. If Glenn's mana is more than 250, that would be great, but... Everyone in the room seemed to think it was a malfunction of the measuring tool. It was the same for Monica. Glenn gingerly lifted a cracked measuring instrument and said, This won't explode. Will it? It's going to be okay, Ryden was fussing over it. The other students were also watching Glenn, as they were buzzing around, now was her chance to get out. Um, I. I need to go to the restroom, oh, sure, Casey nodded easily, without questioning Monica. Relieved by this, Monica sneaked out of the classroom. T that was close. Hiawa, puffing out a long breath. Monica leaned against the wall. Her heart was beating fast. However, she could not rest assured here. There was still plenty of time left for the observation of the elective courses. If she didn't go back to the practical magic course, Casey and Felix might get suspicious. As she trudged down the hallway, Monica pondered over what excuse she should give. Perhaps she should just pretend that she had been in the bathroom for the whole time because she had a stomach ache. As she was thinking of some crude excuse, she caught sight of the classroom of another elective course ahead of her. Since the classroom door was filled with glass, she could see what was going on in there. Is that, chess? Inside the classroom, the students were quietly playing chess. Monica had never played chess before and didn't know the rules but she knew that such tabletop games were popular among the nobles. So chess is also one of the subjects at this academy. Pulling the handout out of her pocket, she saw that chess was indeed one of the courses on the elective list. Judging from the number of students in the classroom, the course seemed to be reasonably popular. I wonder if there's a certain rule behind the movement of those pieces. Somehow, as she was peering through the glass at the table closest to her, the door in front of her rattled open. Surprised, Monica jerked and took a step back. The person who opened the door was a boy with droopy eyes, the Secretary of Student Council Elliot Howard. In the past, he had mocked Monica's dance practice, taken her badge, and thrown it on the roof. As Monica reflexively clutched the badge on her lapel, Elliot smiled. Raising his lips to a grin. Oh, isn't that his highness favorite little squirrel? Are you interested in chess? Come on, I'll teach you. And no, I just... Before Monica could turn on her heel, Elliot's hand grabbed Monica's wrist and dragged her into the classroom. A few of the students who were playing chess in the classroom stopped and paid attention to Monica. Monica felt very awkward about it and quickly lowered her head. Well. You can sit here. How long have you been playing chess? Oh, you don't know the piece names, by any chance. And no, I don't know. When she gave a foolishly honest answer to Elliot's joking words, he chuckled. It wasn't just Elliot. The whole classroom was laughing at Monica. As Elliot laughed and shaking his shoulders, he took a seat in front of Monica. Then I'll teach you what these pieces are and how you move them. This is the pawn. The weakest piece, Elliot held up the black and white pieces and explained what they were and how to move them. Monica's knowledge of board games and cards was limited. 
It's not that she wasn't interested, it's just that she had never had the chance to play them before. When she was still a student at Minerva, she could only see the children of the nobles playing chess from afar. When Elliot finished explaining the pieces, Monica timidly raised one hand and asked. Um, I have a question, what do I have to do to win, haha. <laughs> You really don't know where to start from, do you? The winner is simple. The one who takes the enemy's king wins. That's it. Elliot picked up the white king with his fingertips, squinted his eyes, and smiled mockingly. Chess is a form of mock warfare, an important pastime for the nobles to develop a sense of strategy. Mock warfare Monica looked down at the pieces lined up on the board. Pawn, knight, rook, bishop. Queen, King, Mock Warfare using those six types of pieces. Comma in which positions does the magic soldier hold, maybe something along the lines of a bishop. Since in the past, the monks preferred to use spells, then, are the magicians, monk soldiers spell capability fixed? What are their main strengths and ranges, and how fast can they set up defensive barriers? And what are the individual combat capabilities of the soldiers and the food reserves of the fort? Ha! Huh. As Elliot's eyes widened, Monica questioned more quickly. Does this mock warfare have a defined season, climate, and temperature? What is the height of the terrain? How about the wind direction? Elliot was puzzled by Monica's serious question, but then he started laughing out loud. Oh, come on. How can there be that many elements on this board? This is just a game, little squirrel. You talk like you've been to war before, I have, never been in a war, right? Monica has never participated in a war between humans, but she has participated in dragon slaying. At that time, Monica had been thoroughly drilled by Lewis Miller on how to read strategic charts. The wyvern that Monica defeated had to be killed in the air. That's why she had to know the terrain, the direction of the wind, and the strength of the wind in order to release her magic accurately. But this board had none of that. It's just a flat surface, okay? Hide is irrelevant. The pieces only move in predetermined ways. No negotiations between superiors, just defeating the king, oh oh. Monica asked to make sure, and Elliot nodded with a look as if he were looking at something strange. Still staring at the board, Monica opened her mouth. Then, that would be quite simple, I think. V6 C5, Castling Azeroth GT Silent Witch June 24, 2021 7 minutes then, that would be quite simple, I think. Monica's statement brought chills to the atmosphere in the classroom. Comma how fearless, and shameless, this little girl. Elliot lifted the edge of his mouth his droopy eyes narrowing fiercely as he glared at Monica. Do you understand what you are saying, Miss Norton? You've just made enemies of everyone in this classroom. Monica didn't answer him. She just stared at the board in silence. You're not going to move that pawn forward one square and say, See, I could have easily moved this pawn, aren't you? Monica still didn't say anything. But the blank expression on her face as she stared at the board reminded him of something he had seen before. It was the same expression as when she was reviewing the accounting records she assigned to before. At that time, she gave no reaction when Bridget slapped her on the cheek. Instead, she kept staring at the numbers with her eyes. Elliot felt a strange, unfathomable eeriness in the same blank expression as that time. What came to mind was something Felix had said to him before. When he asked Felix why he had chosen Monica Norton to be student council accountant, Felix replied, Because I don't know where Miss Norton's standing is. Then I'll measure her standing, in this place. Elliot then rearranged the pieces on the chessboard that Monica was staring at so that the white pieces were lined up exactly in her direction. Monica, who had been staring at the board, slowly raised her head and looked at him. He returned Monica's gaze with a fearless grin. Why don't we play one game? I'll play without the queen, who will move first. The play starts from the white piece. How about you go first, 
Monica looked at him with wide eyes as he removed the Black Queen from the board. Then, I'll go first, is that okay? Yeah, sure. While nodding leisurely, Elliot felt a strange irritation in his chest. Even as a beginner, Monica Norton has noticed that in this game, the first one to move has the advantage. Come okay, I'll make my move, with that. Monica didn't hesitate to advance the pawn in the center by two squares. The way to proceed with a pawn seems simple, but it is more complicated than it seems. Basically, it can only move forward one step at a time, but it also can move two squares from its starting point if there are no other pieces in front of it. In addition, the movement becomes unusual only when taking an enemy piece, sometimes moving diagonally and if it advances to the far end, it can be promoted to another piece. I doubt she can understand it after just one explanation. Moving the center pawn ahead was a common move. If the front pieces were not moved quickly enough to open the way, the back pieces will not be able to get through. An amateur approach, I guess. Looking down at the board with cold eyes, Elliot also moved his pieces. The pleasant clicking of the pieces was a sign of someone who was used to playing chess. In comparison, Monica's manner of playing was that of an amateur. Even the way she held and placed the pieces seemed awkward. Comma and yet, there was no hesitation in the way she moved her pieces. When Elliot played his piece, Monica followed quickly with her next piece. This game was just for fun. It wasn't timed, and there was no time limit to begin with. Then, she should have taken her time and think about it as much as she wanted, but when Elliot moved his pieces, Monica moved hers without pause. It was so fast that he wondered if she was moving it blindly. Is that how you're going to put pressure on me? Wait. Looking down at the board, Elliot furrowed his brow. Monica's strategy was like a theory written in a textbook. If this had been any other person, he would not have been so surprised. But Monica was someone who had just learned the rules for the first time. Even so, will using theory alone could make her hold the game this long? Elliot pondered for a moment and then moved his piece. Again, Monica quickly moved her piece. It made him couldn't help but open his mouth. There is no time limit on this game, you know. Why don't you take your time and think about your move? Without replying, Monica just stared at the pieces on the board. Elliot frowned slightly and directed his next move. Immediately, Monica made her next move. At some point, people began to gather around their tables. But the current Elliot didn't pay attention to the gallery around him. His gaze was fixed on the board, and his mouth, which was now covered with one hand, was tensed under his hand. How could it become like this? He was one of the three most skilled players in this classroom. Despite the disadvantage of having no queen, he did not slack off. He was going to beat Monica thoroughly with a handicap, and then checkmate her thoroughly after he got rid of every single piece of the white camp. And yet, he was the one who was now being cornered. That much was apparent to everyone. Monica Norton did not play any strange or bad moves as beginners often do. Her moves were as clean as a textbook, very precise and without any waste. She read all of his moves and then crushed them one by one before collapsing his camp. If this continues, it will only be a matter of time before it falls apart. No, wait. Staring at the board, he realized that there was one thing that could turn the tables. In his camp, his king and rook have not moved yet. And there are no other pieces in between. I can use castling. Only under certain conditions can a king and a rook be moved simultaneously in a single move. That's what castling is. However, he had not yet taught her how to use castling. He thought he could easily beat her without using castling. If I use castling, I can win. But she didn't know about castling. Still, do I have to use it against her? His pride wavered. Should he continue to be defeated? Or win by using the castling that he hadn't taught Monica? The moment his hand stops, the people around him start to stir. They were probably wondering why he hadn't used castling move. 
Comma, that's right. These guys didn't know I haven't taught Monica Norton how to do castling. When he realized this, his hand moved unconsciously to move the king and rook simultaneously, to do castling move. Monica, who had been staring only on the board, blinked and looked at him. Stop. Don't look at me. Trying to escape from Monica's gaze, he turned his gaze away. And yet, his mouth fluently spouted out his excuses. What I just did was a castling, which can be used when you have a king and a rook you haven't moved yet, no other pieces between them, and the king isn't being checkmated, I lost. Before he could finish his explanation, Monica declared defeat. If that castling is valid under the official rules, then I don't think I will able to win, he was astonished. Why is Monica Norton not angry? She had been beaten by a rule she had not been taught. She has the right to be angry that this is not fair. She has the right to do that. And yet, Monica gave him a faint smile without a hint of anger. I'm sorry for saying it was easy, but chess was harder than I thought. No matter how hard I tried to make the best move, my opponent was human, so there were a lot of uncertainties. He was the winner of this game. But what he felt in his heart was a bitter sense of defeat and self-loathing. If only Monica had blamed him for being unfair and using a move she had not been taught, that would make him feel better. But, seeing none of this as a significant issue, she rearranged the pieces and pondered about castling. He was about to say something to her. Whether it was an apology or a questioning voice asking why she didn't blame him, he couldn't tell for himself. Still, he felt he had to say something. But before he can voice it, Boyd, a teacher of this classroom, interjected. A female student over there. What's your name? Monica's gaze wanders left and right, but this classroom has only a few female students in it. And she was the only female student in Boyd's line of sight. Mo, Mo, Mo. Moni, Moni, Moni. She was wincing as she tried her best to move her mouth, but she could not say her name very well only repeating the same sound of Moni Moni. Boyd was a bald tough looking man. His muscular and robust body made him more suited to be wielding a sword or a spear than a chess teacher. It was no wonder Monica was frightened. Elliot let out a slip voice of good grief then interjected. This is Miss Monica Norton. Like me, she is a student council member, Professor Boyd, I remember. Boyd said briefly in a low voice as if came from the bottom of his stomach then handed Monica a sheet of paper, it was an application form for a chess course. Still making strange moany moany voices, Monica alternately looked at Boyd in the application form with teary eyes. In response, Boyd told Monica in a low voice. Be sure to take the course, Monica still whined Moni Moni as she could only agree to him before motioning her head up and down stiffly. That probably is a face that doesn't understand what she's getting into. Elliot closed his eyes as he let out a sigh exasperatedly. These 6 C6, circumstances behind the chocolate Azareth GT Silent Witch June 27, 2021 10 minutes after school, for the first time in a week. Monica showed up at the student council room, and Felix was watching her as he lowered his brows. Miss Norton, I haven't seen you around halfway through the course observation, where have you been, I wonder, Monica winced and decided to make the same excuse she had made to Casey. You um, you see, I went to the restroom, and on the way, I, was invited into the chess class, to be precise. She was not invited but was dragged in forcibly by Elliot. After that one match with Elliot, the course observation period was over, so Monica couldn't visit the other courses. Felix seemed to get a bit surprised when he heard her mention the chess class, so he turned his gaze to Elliot Howard, who was doing some assignment in the back. Speaking of chess, I remember Secretary Howard was picking up such a course. Elliot was quietly going through the paperwork, probably pretending not to hear. Elliot and Bridget, who clearly weren't pleased to have Monica as a student council member, treated her as if she were heir or something non-existent when she was in the student council room. 
But today, Elliot was a little strange. The way he ignored her was very obvious as if he had disgruntled towards someone. D did I do, something wrong or say something rude, again? As Monica was breaking out in a cold sweat, Cyril Ashley came back from the archives room and stared at Monica. You're not forcing yourself, are you? I am not. And I'm sorry for the inconvenience, of taking a W week off. The last time she saw Cyril was in the infirmary after Monica had been poisoned and collapsed. It has been a while since the time he had shouted at her on how he was going to tie her up with a rope if she ever tried to escape from her bed. After done staring at Monica's face intently, Cyril then crossed his arms and snorting haughtily. I've got to take over your work for the past week you've been absent. So, be prepared, because I'm going to give you a thorough work today. Why yes, Monica nodded tensely with tears in her eyes and took the bundle of documents that Cyril handed to her. She then moved to her work desk to check the week's worth of documents, but there was nothing particularly unusual to note, in fact, all the work had been neatly organized. All Monica had to do was to read the contents. The meticulous, detailed handwriting probably belonged to Cyril. He had taken over Monica's work for a week. Determined not to cause him any more trouble, Monica refocused her concentration on the documents. As expected, the thickest document was things related to the school festival which held on next month. As she was looking over the draft budget, a voice came from behind Monica. Hey, not realizing that it was directed at her, Monica kept her eyes fixed on the draft budget. Cyril, who was working on something else besides her, looked at her in exasperation. Monica Norton. You're called out, W.A. After letting out some silly words, she turned around and saw Elliot standing behind her. Elliot seemed to have a bitter look on his face when he turned his gaze down at Monica. Miss Norton, do you have some time after this today, eh? Um, when she heard about the after-school call. Would it be what they called love confession but Monica didn't have the nerve to get excited about it. This might what you call when someone calling a person out in a place where absolutely no one around, only to abuse that person and beat her him up later. Perhaps, he's planning to take her badge again. As Monica unconsciously clutched the badge on her lapel as she cast her head down, Cyril interrupted him. Make it another day. She has a week's worth of work to catch up on today, well, okay. I'm sorry for interrupting your work, strangely, Elliot looked relieved and went back to his seat. As Monica watched his back, Cyril whispered to her. Did something happen between you and Secretary Howard, I am not sure, but during chess class, I might have said something rude, she just played one game of chess during the course observation. However. Monica might not have noticed, but there was a great possibility that she had made Elliot displeased. But playing chess seems fun. I'd like to take that course. Unlike mathematical equations, the opponent in chess is a human being. Therefore, a strategic aspect of the game cannot be won by just calculating probabilities. And that kind of aspect was what made Monica's God interested in it. Are you not going to take the magic courses? At Cyril's sudden words, Monica's hand that was holding the pen trembled. Why do Felix, Cyril, and everyone else want to encourage Monica to pick up the magic chorus? I think it's too difficult for me. What about you Lord Ashley? Did you choose the practical magic as your elective course? I currently taking up an advanced practical magic course. Advanced Practical Magic was a special elective course that required students to complete a certain number of courses. Advanced Practical Magic is only available to those who have excelled in Practical Magic in their first or second year. If you wish to pick up that course, you must have completed both Practical Magic and Elementary Magic within your first or second year, I see. In other words, if a second year like you want to take advanced practical magic course next year, you have to pick both in elementary magic and practical magic this year. Oh, as Monica vaguely responded to him, Cyril tapped his fingers on the desk and eyed Monica. 
So let me ask you again, are you not going to take the magic courses, um? Well, Monica was an undercover student at the academy who was hiding her true identity. Even if it's just an elective course, whenever there's magic involved, she's got a feeling she's going to slip up. Especially when magic formulas are involved, she might inadvertently get carried away. I will not pick up the magic courses, I see. After a short murmur, Cyril returned to his work, and Monica decided to concentrate on the documents in front of her. After the day's student council works were settled, Cyril made a suggestion to Felix. Treasurer Norton and I will be staying behind to finish things up. I will lock the door, okay? I'll leave it to you, but, make sure not to stay up too late, I will, once Cyril nodded. The rest of the student council members began to leave the student council room. All that remained in the room were Cyril and Monica. Monica looked at the documents on her desk and tilted her head. I wonder what kind of task to have a staying behind? To tell the truth, Monica couldn't think of any duties that required her to stay behind. The week's duties have been taken over during normal duty hours, and today's duties have been completed. Um. Lord Ashley. Do these tasks were related to the school festival, it's not. Clear your desk and wait a moment, oh okay, why the desk should be cleared when the tasks need to be done? Despite her doubts, Monica did as she was told, put the documents back on the shelf, and sat down on a chair to wait for Cyril to return. Apparently, Cyril had left the student council room. Could it be that he has something to bring from the other room? Restlessly fidgeting her fingers on her lap, Cyril came back with something in both hands. In Cyril's hand was a white cup. It was not a kind of elegant cup used for a tea party, but just a plain white cup that was a bit thick and chunky. Cyril placed one of the cups in front of Monica and sat down across her. Drink this, Monica looked at the cup that was placed in front of her. It contained a light brown liquid. The color was lighter than coffee and the scent had faintly sweet. Monica had smelled his scent once before. Is this, chocolate? Yeah, chocolate is a popular delicacy among the nobility. It is a drink made by grinding cocoa beans and mixing them with sugar and milk. It has a distinctive flavor and is more expensive than coffee. Monica had been given a drink of chocolate once before but the chocolate was supposed to be more sludgy. Lifting the cup fearfully, the liquid inside shook. It looks lighter and silkier than the one Monica had drunk before. Cyril sipped his cup with a nonchalant look on his face. Monica imitated him and sipped from the cup. Kama Monica rounded her eyes in surprise. The light texture and mild sweetness were unlike any other chocolate she'd had before. It wasn't sludgy and the sourness characteristic of cocoa was milder. Preparing a drink of chocolate took more work than coffee. Coffee beans can be stored to some extent just fine after they've been ground, but cacao beans have a high fat content, so they can never be stored even after being ground. In other words, to make this kind of drink, grinding it first was a must. Since it involved that much effort, chocolate was not popular as coffee. However, this chocolate did not have the thick texture characteristic of fat. This chocolate, has less fat, that's right. The beans are processed by removing the fat from the beans and grinding them into a powder. By using the latest technology, if cacao beans could be preserved in powder form, it would be a very revolutionary invention. It will be easier to store than ever before, and easier to drink because it will be dissolved in water or milk. As Monica secretly admired it, Cyril glanced at Monica with one eye. I heard about your incident from Claudia. You drank the poison bitter tea that the daughter of Count Norn prepared for you. Why yeah, the bitter poison was put into a cup of tea, but instead of spitting it out, Monica drank it while still thinking, is this sort of drink? As a result, it ended up becoming a commotion. As Monica shrank from the memory of that incident, Cyril stated in a strong tone. Because you usually don't eat enough of the good food, it ended up that way. You should have improved your diet. 
You cannot afford to bother His Highness again, like the other day, I, I will. I'm sorry, in other words, this is for His Highness. You got it, why yes, in response to Monica's shaking of her head, Cyril nodded and tipped his cup, saying, as long you understand, you've been elected by His Highness for your abilities. Then again, there's no guarantee that someone jealous of your ability won't cause an incident like what the daughter of Count Norn did. Cyril was absolutely right. Originally, Monica was supposed to be the one guarding Felix, but instead, she was being helped by him. You should at least learn to defend yourself. Don't let His Highness keep handle it for you. Yes, Monica hung her head in shame and thought absent-mindedly. Has Cyril ever been jealous of someone else? Two? He shouldn't, shouldn't have. Being a part of the second prince's entourage would attract a lot of admiration and envy. There would be no small number of envious people. And now, Monica was in the same position as him. Um, Lord Ashley. T thank you, very much. For the other day, and, uh, for this chocolate too, Cyril snorted as usual and blurted out, just taste it and drink it. Monica nodded her head and drank the warm chocolate to relish it. Cyril, who had been staring at such Monica, suddenly opened his mouth as if he had remembered something. Let me tell you one thing, don't tell His Highness about today. Especially about this chocolate, um, Lord Ashley. Cyril glared at Monica with a deep crease between his eyebrows when Monica interrupted him with a freaked out expression. What, His Highness? What's about His Highness, is behind you, Cyril's expression vanished from his face. Behind Cyril, Felix was standing there with a broad smile on his face. The way he eliminated all signs of his presence was as good as that of an assassin. How can you have a tea party without me, why why your Highness, I never thought I'd hear that stuttering way of speaking from anyone other than Miss Norton, ah, no, this is, just. Cyril became unusually pale and flustered. His gaze in particular was flickering over the cup in his hand. It's as if he wants to hide the chocolate from Felix. In response to such Cyril, Felix smiled with his usual gentle smile. You don't have to hide it from me. I wouldn't mind having something like that, you know, you um, but, Cyril's panic was like that of a criminal who has been found in possession of illegal drugs. Why was he getting so flustered? I'd like some of those chocolates. Could you make some for me too? When Felix said this, Cyril gave a yes answer with a somewhat relieved look on his face and left the room at a brisk pace. Looking over his back, Felix let out a sigh. You don't have to be so uptight, unsure of the meaning of the exchange between Felix and Cyril, Monica asked Felix with trepidation. Oh, um. Is this chocolate, actually, something I shouldn't drink, no, not at all. In fact, it's become a trend among the nobility in this kingdom lately, then why was Cyril so flustered? Monica tilted her head, but Felix said it was nothing. As for the technique to remove fat from cocoa beans, it was invented by a scholar from the neighboring kingdom of Randall. The Kingdom of Randall was a small kingdom located between the Kingdom of Riddle and the Great Empire to the east. How did Cyril's flustered behavior have anything to do with what the scholar there had invented? Monica had no idea, but Felix then told her. The mother of my elder brother Lenel is the Princess of Randall. Finally, Monica understood why Cyril had tried to hide the chocolate from Felix. There were three princes in this country but each had a different mother. The mother of the first Prince Inal was the Princess of Randall. As a result, many members of his faction naturally place importance on the connection with Randall. Cyril was probably worried that his fondness for the latest technology of Randall's chocolates would make His Highness think he was a person of the first Prince faction. Whenever I show up at a tea party, no one offers me chocolates made with Randall's techniques. I mean, What's the harm in something that tastes good? After saying that, Felix snatched the cup out of Monica's hand and took a sip of the chocolate. The prince himself sipped from a cup that someone else had sipped from, a spectacle that would make Cyril's eyes widen. 
However, to Monica, Felix's current actions seem to be an indication of his openness. Comma being royalty must be tough, yeah, really, Felix's profile, as he muttered, lacked his usual calmness, there was a coldness in his face as if he was looking down on the ridiculousness. V6 C7, oh my, what a capable sister I am, how about you compliment me, my dear brother. As Earth GT Silent Witch June 29, 2021 8 minutes lately, it had become a regular occurrence for her to have lunch with Lana, Casey, and Claudio whenever lunch time came around. Today, as the four of them were having meals together, they could hear people around them talking about the school festival. The school festival was only one month away. And all the students were busy preparing for it. The costumes for this year's show will be really amazing. After all, I supervised them myself. Lana proudly said as she tore off a piece of bread, and Casey smiled as she put a fish fry in her bread. Well, that was pretty intense. I mean, the battle between the students of the History Research Club and Lana, it seems that Lana, who was chosen to be a costume designer for the play that was the centerpiece of the school festival, had a heated discussion with the president of the History Research Club about costumes. The debate between the president of the History Research Club, who insisted that the costume should be based on folklore, and Lana, who insisted that the costume should be trendy and glamorous, lasted for several days, and in the end, the two shook hands like war buddies. You um, what kind of play are you performing? In response to Monica's questioning voice, Casey said while taking a bite of bread. Ah, of course. This is your first time participating in this year's event. Every year, the play is decided to be a story about the Spirit Kings and the Founder King. It's a story that everyone in this country has heard since childhood. About a thousand years ago, the Founder King of the Kingdom of Riddle made a pact with the seven Spirit Kings of Fire, Water, Earth, Thunder, Wind, Light, and Darkness to bring peace to a land ravaged by the dragon by using their power to exterminate the evil dragon. And so, in this land of peace, he founded a kingdom, or so was the founding legend told. According to the school, this play was the main highlight of the Serendia Academy Festival. There will also be choral and music recitals, charity bazaars, tea parties, and finally a dance party at the end of the day. And Monica, the treasurer, stared blankly at the draft budget because of the large amount of money involved. Monica had thought that the students would have made their own stage sets and costumes for their play, but this was the Sarandia Academy. Basically, once the students have decided on the design, the rest of the work was mostly outsourced. And the stage sets and costumes made by the professionals were said to be quite magnificent. I, I was so surprised when I read the report. They even set off fireworks, at Monica's words, Claudia, who had been quietly sipping her soup until now, blurted out. Comma that's right, there would be many sounds booming from morning until night. I find it more annoyance than anything, it would better be doing fireworks more flashy. In response to Claudia's comment, Lana clenched her fist and made a strong argument. From her response. It looks like Lana might have a hand in the stage production as well. When Lana started to talk about the performance, Casey, who was listening to her, let out a big yawn. In response to an unladylike yawn, Lana's lips burst. What? Is my story so boring that it makes you sleepy? Sorry, I'm a little sleep deprived. I was up late making embroidery for the charity bazaar. Why you all seems to be so busy? When Monica commented, and Lana, Casey, and Claudio all looked at Monica at once. The three of them have a rare look of unanimity on their faces, a look of surprise. Lana then spoke up on behalf of the three of them. Despite what you might think, the busiest person right now is probably you, Monica, eh? I is that so? It was true that the workload had increased dramatically in the past few days, but in Monica's opinion, the amount of work she had been doing in the first place was not that great. With the school festival approaching, 
the amount of work related to accounting had increased, but it wasn't that hard for Monica. Ever since she was holed up in the mountain cabin, she had to deal with more complicated and cumbersome materials. Compared to that, it's not much work. If anything, it was probably more difficult when I was at Minerva. At the institution training magicians of Minerva, the main focus of the school festival was to present the results of each student's research. As a scholarship student, Monica was naturally required to make a presentation on her research, and she worked hard to prepare papers and materials. At that time, she had prepared everything for the exhibition and stayed in her laboratory on the day of the festival, so she didn't really understand what kind of atmosphere the festival had. But now, even more so than when she was at Minerva, she could feel the exuberance of her surroundings spreading to her. Monica hates crowded places. The worst place for that is a festival. Now I think I might actually feel a little excited. Although there was no clear image of what she wanted to do with the school festival, she hoped it would be successful. Safely and without incident. Monica Norton, suddenly, a voice called out to her, and she looked up to see the vice president, Cyril, approaching her. As Monica straightened her back unconsciously, Cyril held out a sheet of paper. After school today, we have work to supervise the incoming materials. We the student council members need to be present there, so come to the east gate after school. This is the list of materials. Try to get it into your head, the east gate, it was a gate that was usually closed and rarely used. When Monica voiced her question, Cyril gave a small nod. We have so many materials to bring in, if all the suppliers use the main gate, they'll get in the way of the students, according to Cyril. There will be three suppliers coming for today alone. There were fabrics for costumes, fireworks, and wood. Of all the materials, wood has the biggest volume, so it had to be brought in through the east gate. The fireworks will be supervised by His Highness and Secretary Howard. Secretary Graham and General Manager Maywood will be in charge of clothing-related matters. While we're in charge of the wood, I, I understand, Monica nodded and Claudia, sitting next to her, sipped her tea and blurted out. Kama how careless of you to divulge the plans of the student council members to a third party. Cyril's eyebrows twitched up at Claudia's words, and he glared at his sister. I have no problem with other students knowing our schedule, so Neil will be alone with Bridget Graham for the verification process, alone with a woman other than me. I guess I have to intervene, cut it out. Claudia Ashley was a person who would seriously carry out what seemed like a bad joke. Especially when his fiancé, Neil, was involved. The verification process is also witnessed by the supplier. They will never be alone. And don't you dare interfere with our work. And Monica Norton. The amount of wood we are in charge of is quite a lot. Be there as soon as class is over, yes, Lord Ashley. As Monica nodded her head, a slender arm wrapped easily around Monica's round head, it was Claudia. Oh dear, what a problem. My name is Ashley, too, uh, well, Lady Claudia is Lady Claudia, and, well, uh, oh dear, she won't call you by your name, will she, my dear brother? Since I am friends with Monica, she calls me by my first name but she doesn't call you by your first name because you are just an acquaintance. I guess it can't be helped, since you just an acquaintance. Oh, how sad you are, for not being adored by your juniors, my dear brother, as Claudia smiled thinly looking up at Cyril, Cyril's cheeks twitched tensely. She's been thinking for a while, but it seemed that these two siblings didn't get along very well. Both Lana and Casey looked troubled as they watched the interaction between the two siblings. Monica was nervous. If she didn't do anything, Cyril would become a pitiful senior who wasn't adored by his junior. Um, Lord Ashley, I mean, the older brother, Lord Ashley, is very good at his job, he's a great person, and I, I respect him. At Monica's best follow-up, Cyril glared at Monica moving his gleaming blue eyes. Scary. 
I am SSSS sorry. That's right, I should have, just called you Vice President, right? I'm sorry, Vice President, Cyril was glaring at Claudio with a bitter look on his face, but to Monica, it looked like he was the one being glared at. Cyril exhaled deeply when he saw that Monica was shaking with tears in her eyes. Comma Cyril is fine, why why yes, Lord Cyril, when Monica said this in a quivering voice, Claudia giggled close to Monica's ear. Comma oh, my, my dear brother, who is just an acquaintance, is making a big deal about being called by his name, I've never thought of you to have a friend. Claudia, of course I have. We're very good friends. Right, Monica, when Monica cocked her head up and down, Cyril's brow wrinkled. Monica Norton. You're not being forced by Claudia, are you? NNNNU, TTTT that's not true. Monica now shook her head, and Claudia pressed her body even closer to Monica's. Claudia gave off a very nice smell. And yet, it didn't make her feel any better. Comma how terrible. I can't believe you're jealous of our friendship. You're jealous of me and Monica because we're so close. Who would be jealous of the likes of you? Why don't you take a look? Maybe you should check it out for yourself because you look terrible with jealousy on your face. Blue veins were popping up on Cyril's face. He was a step away before the rage burst. Monica hurriedly spoke up. D don't worry. LL Lord Cyril looks the same as always, after all, Cyril always had that angry look on his face when he interacted with Monica. Nothing to lie about, it's the same as always. Comma oh, my dear brother, you get jealous all the time regardless of who it is, and no you, I, I didn't mean it like that, Monica Norton. If Claudia is causing you trouble, tell her so, no, um. You don't think I'm bothering you, do you, Monica? I, I'd never. An older brother with a platinum blonde and a beautiful face, and a younger sister with black hair who was one of the three most beautiful girls in the school. Even getting caught between the exchange of the beautiful siblings, Monica still looked as if she was about to die. Casey, who was drinking tea after done eating her lunch, muttered in exasperation. Comma I guess Miss Claudia is playing with them, both Cyril and Monica were being played in Claudia's hands. What a terrible personality, thought Lana as she's rubbing her forehead and let out a sigh. V6 C8, Severed Rope Azareth GT Silent Witch July 1st, 2021 6 minutes as Monica's familiar, Nero mainly spent his daytime strolling around the school grounds. Of course. As an excellent familiar, he did not just sit idly and bask in the sun lazily. While studying humans by secretly listening to the class outside the window, he was also keeping an eye out for anyone suspicious in the vicinity of the second prince. Particularly since Monica had told him that outsiders would be coming and going today, he was even putting more effort into keeping Felix's surroundings than usual. Well. Since that prince has a contracted spirit, I doubt anything will happen to him. With his good sensing at Mana, Nero had noticed that the white lizard was always in Felix's pocket. It was probably a high-ranking water spirit. Speaking of contracted spirit, according to the magic class he's been secretly listening to lately, making a contract with a spirit can only be done by an advanced magician or above. Then, does that prince a magician? It's best to ask Monica directly about this kind of thing. After all, she was a magician who stood at the peak of the kingdom, one of the seven sages. It may not seem like it, but when it comes to magic knowledge, not many people can match Monica. As he was thinking that he should ask Monica to teach him about the contract with the spirits, something caught Nero's senses. Nero's whiskers twitched, then he focused on his attention. It was a weak mana reaction. Since this school taught practical magic, it was not surprising to detect a mana reaction. But its location was incongruous. Is that a warehouse? They're moving something in. In the large warehouse on the west side of the school, a number of employees of the supplier were coming and going, bringing in wooden crates. 
With his good nose, Nero immediately noticed that the contents inside were some kind of gunpowder. Monica said the stuff they're bringing in were materials for the festival. Do humans use gunpowder for festivals? Are they going to do some construction work? The sight of the crates being carried in was a bit of a mystery to Nero, who has never seen fireworks before. The person supervising the people loading the crates was the second prince, the target of the escort. Next to him stood a droopy-eyes person with a bad personality. The prince and droopy-eyes were unaware that there's a mana reaction in the warehouse, or so seems like that. Nero had noticed it immediately because of his keen sense of mana, but apparently, humans weren't like that. It made him recall what Monica had mentioned before. In order for humans to detect mana, they need to use a specialized spell for sensing, or something like that. I have a bad feeling about this. Nero jumped down from the tree and ran to the east gate where Monica was. When Monica headed for her designated place at the east gate after the class finished, the suppliers were already bringing in the materials. And Cyril was giving instructions to the suppliers near the east warehouse. As Monica rushed over to him, struggling to overcome her slow pace, Cyril raised his eyebrows and yelled, So slow. Lord, Cyril. I apologize, for being la a cough cough, due to her lack of physical strength. Having only run this far made Monica unable to catch her breath. Aware of Monica's lack of physicality, Cyril stared down at Monica, who was breathing heavily, rubbed his forehead with his finger. Hurry up and adjust your unbecoming breathing. The materials have only just been brought in. It probably won't be finished soon, why yes. Also, the person in charge of stage design should be here today to check on the materials. Cyril then looked around and saw a figure coming towards him from the school building. Looks like she's here, turning her eyes to where Cyril was looking, Monica blinked her eyes. The one who was coming towards them was a lively looking girl with light brown hair tied up into a single knot, it was Casey. Sorry to keep you waiting. Our design director got into an argument with the historical research club. Since it won't be over for a while. I came here on behalf of her. I'm Casey Groove from the second year, since it will only be counting the quantity, even you're the represent, it won't be a problem, yes, I look forward to working with you. You too, Monica, when Casey called out to her, Monica nodded her head. In truth, Monica was relieved to see Casey here since she couldn't talk properly to someone she had never met before. As a shy person. Monica has no trouble in work that related to numbers, no matter how much work there is, but when it comes to reporting, giving instructions, and other tasks that require interpersonal skills, it only makes the difficulty level rise as quickly. As Monica patting her chest relieved at Casey's arrival, Cyril gave her instructions. I will inform the suppliers where to store the materials. Treasurer Norton you will check the list to see if there are any omissions, you understood, as Monica nodded, Casey patted her on the shoulder. I'll help Monica. Maybe we can check the materials together while at it, T thank you, Casey smiled pleasantly, you're welcome, and picked up the list. When Casey saw the names and quantities of the materials lined up, she retracted her pleasant smile. Her cheeks were slightly tensed. Come wow. These numbers, are, so jam-packed, Monica was strangely excited to see all the numbers lined up in a condensed, but apparently, most people are not. Casey was no exception, and with a weary look on her face, she held out the list to Monica. I will do the actual counting. So can I ask you to verify it on the list, okay, matching the data was Monica's forte. Casey handed Monica the list with a wry smile and ran over to the materials already brought in. Most of the woods brought in were already processed. Some were thin boards, some were sticks, and some were already assembled into some form. All of them were probably things that will be used on stage. Casey will be counting the type and number of woods, and Monica will verify it against the list. After repeating the process for a while, Monica suddenly looked up. 
There was no trace of Casey in her line of sight. Comma, huh? Casey. Monica turned her head from the list and looked for Casey. Then, from the other side of the wood ahead, over here she heard Casey's voice. Apparently, the woods had obscured Casey's figure from her sight. The back of the warehouse had been mostly checked, so it might be better if she moved herself a little closer to the entrance. While Monica was walking towards Casey with the list in her hand, she heard something snapped. What is that? The very next moment, the woods, which had been tied with ropes and placed vertically, tilted diagonally. The rope that held the wood in place was broken off in the middle. Monica, over here, Casey was standing just in the direction of the falling wood. And she was unaware that the wood was falling towards her. Watch out, Cyril, who had been giving instructions outside the warehouse shouted briefly and began chanting a spell in rapid succession. Perhaps he was trying to help Casey by casting a spell. But the wood was already looming over Casey's head. Using chanting won't work in time. Comma right, if he uses chanting. Please make it in time. But Monica quickly invoked her wind with her no chant spell. By calculating the position of the wood and the angle at which it will fall, Monica was able to slightly shift the position at which the wood will fall with minimal force. Kaya, the sound of rattling wood toppling over coincided with Casey's scream. A cold sweat ran down Monica's back. Did I make it in time? Treasurer Norton. Miss Casey. Are you all right? Cyril's expression changed as he rushed over to the two. Monica nodded stiffly and went over to Casey on shaky legs. Slumped on the floor, there were no visible injuries to Casey. The wood all toppled down away from Casey's body, just as Monica had calculated. But her face was completely pale as she's shaking. Hey, are you okay? Monica addressed her, and Casey nodded without words and trembling. You too, you're not hurt, are you? Cyril came running up to us and looked at Monica and Casey alternately to see if they were injured. Needless to say for Monica, Casey was not injured. Still, Cyril ordered them to go to the infirmary, just to be safe. I'll take charge of this place. In some cases, I may need to press the supplier for the cause of this accident. You two should rest in the infirmary, oh okay. Monica reached out to the slumped Casey and asked, Can you stand up? Casey nodded once, took Monica's hand and stood up staggeringly. Monica bit her lip as she looked at the rope that had been bundling the wood, took Casey's hand, and walked away. V6C9, Kong Flame, Azeroth GT Silent Witch July 3, 2021 7 minutes Casey was the kind of girl who always had a lively smile. She was like a caring and dependable big sister who would take Monica's hand to guide her. Now Casey was walking next to her while clinging on to Monica's hand. The hand she held was moist and cold with sweat, and she could tell that she was shaking slightly. As Monica stared at her hand, Casey smiled unreliably with a pale face. Sorry, I showed you something embarrassing, and no, I mean, after what happened, who wouldn't, haha, <laughs> I guess so. Casey smiled awkwardly as if she was trying to smile like she usually did but failed. The way she laughed, her pale face, and her unreliable, shaking hands, they cut into Monica's heart. The two were walking across the corridor of the East School building. There was still some distance ahead before they could reach the infirmary. Monica bit her lip, then slowly opened her mouth. The rope used to bind the wood, had a cut mark made with a blade. What, then, that wasn't an accident, was there a cut in the rope from the start? Did someone from the supplier had intended to take someone's life, at Casey's words, Monica shook her head. No, if you paid close attention to the cut of the rope, the blade was inserted halfway into the rope, the rest was left for it to cut naturally. I've got that result from my calculation. If you put a cut of that depth in the rope. It takes only a few seconds for the rope before it completely tears off. I don't know the exact weight of the wood, but from what I estimated announced Monica, then followed by her speculation. 
It would snap after 5 to 15 seconds elapsed. They could leave a cut in that rope before it was completely torn off in 10 seconds. In other words, the rope wasn't cut before it was brought to the school, but someone put a cut in it on the spot. And Monica also knew. For outsiders to enter this school, they would be examined before the school gives them permission. Let alone knives, even bringing a single pair of scissors was not allowed. So to get all the necessary tools, they must submit a request before they could borrow it from the school. Come on since people from suppliers weren't allowed to bring in knives, the one who cut it can't be them, it made the expression on Casey's face disappeared. And yet, Monica still staring at her shaking sweaty hands. And then, Monica gulped and said, Comma did you cut the rope, Casey? Casey instantly tore away her hand from Monica's. She then walked a few steps ahead of Monica to stop suddenly before turning her body around to look back at her. What appeared on her face was the same cheerful smile as always. Ha ha, I guess you caught me, yeah, I did it. To her surprise, Casey confessed easily, then pulling a small craft knife out of his pocket and flashing it at her. At which made Monica let out an awe voice. Comma why, to tell you the truth, I hate you, Monica. Actually, I was planning to make those woods fell on you as a prank, or so I thought. But then I screwed up and the wood fell on me. Oh, man, I am totally screwed up, am I? Casey's tone of voice and the way she laughed might have made her think looked as usual. However, there was something about her behavior that she couldn't shake off. Casey's words sounded strange. It was like she spoke the lines she had memorized. She was speaking faster than usual, and her eyes never looked straight at Monica. Casey was lying. Come I know you're lying, I'm not lying. I've hated you since the first time I saw you, Casey's words stab into Monica's heart. Whenever the word hate used, it always ended up hurts people's hearts. If it was the usual Monica, she might have running away in tears but the discomfort feeling felt stronger in Monica's chest. Casey, are you hiding something from me? I have nothing to hide, really. I just hate you. That's the only reason I was trying to harass you. Casey lifted the edge of her lips slightly in a snarl and looked at Monica with a very nasty look on her face. Do you remember the previous tea party, when your tea leaves were dumped down? Yeah, the truth is I was the perpetrator. The tone of her voice was easygoing without a hint of guilt. Yet, Monica did not feel any anger. What welled up inside was only the sense of discomfort and sadness. In which, Monica lowered her eyes then muttered a few words. Comma I know, what? Casey blinked in surprise, and then Monica clutched the hem of her uniform and said. In the past, I've been bullied, and many of my things have been hidden from me. Ever since that, I've never written my name on my personal belongings. At that time, Casey gave Monica a piece of paper to mark the teacon she had put on the shelf. Casey had written her name on the paper, but Monica hadn't, fearing that someone would throw hers away. So, she folded the edge of the paper to mark it in a way that only she could understand. Come at the time, the only person who watched me fold the paper, was you, Casey. Being timid and cautious, Monica made sure to hide the paper with her own body to prevent anyone from seeing it, whenever she was folding the paper or putting the can on a shelf. In other words, the only person who knew which is Monica's tea can was Casey. Since Casey didn't have any servants, she had to make the tea on her own, so she left shortly into the preparation room before Monica's turn. She probably did dump down Monica's tea leaves at that time. At Monica's remark, Casey looked dumbfounded, but eventually brushed back her bangs and smiled hollowly. Ah ha, I knew it, you're very smart, I see, so you've known all along. If I think about it, you always speak casually to Lana, but always used honorific when talking to me. I guess you've been wary of me, even so, you have helped me a lot lately. So I thought, maybe all of it just a misunderstanding. When Monica was devastated because her tea leaves were dumped down, 
Casey kindly gave her own tea to use. After that event, she's been inviting Monica to eat lunch together and showed her concern for her in any way she could. That's why Monica had always turned her eyes away from the truth. She tried to convince herself that there must have been some misunderstanding. Hey, Monica. Do you still remember the things we talked about in the cafeteria? The one where my father told me to go catch his highness I, I do, the truth, I really want to become his highness's wife and the future queen. So I thought that if I befriended you, Monica, whom his highness is very fond of, I would have more chances to get close to his highness. That's why I started being nice to you and pretending to be your friend. Ha ha, I am so terrible, right, Casey's words seemed to make sense. However, an uncomfortable feeling was still stuck in Monica's chest and would not come off. Monica wasn't very good at dealing with people. So until now, she had never really looked at the person in front of her. However, since coming to this school and coming into contact with many people, Monica has learned to get to know others just a little bit. That's why she was certain. Casey was hiding something from her. But unable to figure out what that something was, Monica clutched the chest part of her dress in frustration. What's Casey hiding? If I don't find out soon, there will be no turning back for her as Monica was getting impatient with this premonition. One of the windows in the hallway opened with great force and a man jumped in. Monica, it was the first floor, nonetheless, a young man with black hair jumped in through the window, it was Nero in human form. Whenever Nero transformed into a human, he always wore an old-fashioned robe, but now he was wearing the uniform of a male student of Sarandia Academy. Neck, row? W what's wrong with your outfit? Oh, doesn't it look nice? If I were a cat, I'd be picked out of the school building and if I wore my usual robe, I'd look suspicious, so I made put a little of my mana to make something. At first, I imagined your uniform, but I accidentally ended up with a skirt, so I had to start all over again. Wait, that's not the point, Nero turned his sharp gaze to the west and promptly stated. There is some kind of strange mana reaction in the west warehouse. And it's getting stronger by the moment. Casey was stunned by the mysterious man who appeared in from the window, but as soon as she heard his words, she quickly turned pale. Monica immediately activated her mana-sensing spell without chanting. In the opposite direction from the east side of the school building where they were, was a warehouse to the west. Sure enough, there was a mana reaction there. It sucked up a small amount of mana from its surroundings to expand gradually. It has fire attribute, the way it absorbs and compresses mana of its surroundings, and this inwardly swirling flow of mana is, it can't be. Monica had once seen this unique flow of mana in a class on Minerva's magic tools. A magic tool for assassination with extremely high killing power. Its name was. Kama Cotton Flame. The moment Monica uttered these words, Casey's eyes widened as she let out a faint voice. How could Monica know about, Kwong Flame, the moment she heard that murmur, all of Casey's behaviors so far were linked together. At the West Warehouse, fireworks were being brought in. Felix and Elliot were supervising the process. Since Casey was approaching Monica and pretending to be her friend. Her real reason should be. Kama Casey, is your goal, to assassinate his highness, Casey didn't give an answer but her tense face told Monica everything. This 6 C10, Puppet Prince Azareth GT Silent Witch July 5, 2021 11 minutes The fireworks used in school festivals were divided into two main types, those that will be launched into the sky periodically, and those that will be used in the play. While the former would be brought in the day before the festival, the latter would be brought in first as it would be used for rehearsals. In addition to student council members Felix and Elliot, Miss Mabel Haynes, who was also responsible for stage direction, was present at the delivery. The fireworks used in the play will be handled by specialized companies, but even those who are responsible for the play need to know how to handle them. 
Mabel Haynes was a third-year student who gave the impression of being a smart person. Though she usually read books quietly with her glasses on, when she was involved in the play she was famous for her eyes would be blazing like a different person. And now, such a girl was approaching Felix, who was supervising bringing in the goods, said your highness in a sweet voice that did not hide her flirtation. Have you thought about what I said the other day, oh, the thing about me taking part in the play? I thought I turned you down last time, I did say, please give it some thought. But you haven't given any refusal of the thought itself. So I can take it as you're still thinking about it, Mabel spoke her quibble as she glaring at Felix with her blazing eyes. The pressure Mabel exuding was so strong, even Elliot, who was checking the list next to her silently distanced away from Felix. I am aware of your busy schedule as a member of the student council. But only a little bit, just a little bit, please. Taken part of the last scene, just the last scene of the Founder King, I hope you could you take that role, your highness, the play would not be perfect if the person who had been playing the role up to that point changed into me when the final scene came, thought it's not true. I'm sure everyone who sees the play will break down in tears with cheers. I can even hear the sounds of the crowd cheering and applauding like the earth is about to break. What an exaggeration, thought Felix as he brushed off Mabel's claims. Mabel always kept her manner composed. But, when the play involved, she will talk too much. If I can be honest with you, I wanted you to play the role of the Founder King, Lord Ashley to play Sheffield the spirit king of the wind, Lady Graham to play Lurkula, the spirit king of the water, and Lord Elliot to play Arclade, the spirit king of the earth. I wonder why as our student council members are so gorgeous. Simply having them standing on the play was enough to leave huge impressions. I'm sure of it, Felix pretended not to hear and continued to check the crate silently. Mabel walked around to the front of Felix and looked up at him with a look that was even hotter than that of a maiden in love. Would you please reconsider? Even Lady Elian, who's got the role of the queen, also expressed her desire for you to play the role, Elian. The moment that name came up, Felix's blue eyes darkened just a little bit. But as his gentle smile remained intact, he then told Mabel, Maybe I will give you a formal response here. We, the student council members, are not allowed to participate in any play. If you're still insisting any longer, I'll have to consider it as an attempt to disrupt the work of student council. At the strong words of refusal, Mabel let out an unladylike ug and bit down on her handkerchief. In response to Mabel, Felix retracted his harsh attitude and gave her a gentle smile. I am sure the play will be a success even without me involved. I hope it will become a great play that will live up to my expectations. With that being said, Mabel couldn't insist any longer. Mabel could only nod her head before letting out a deep sigh. As Felix went back to his work after successfully dealt with Mabel, Elliot, who had been watching from a distance, came back to join him. It was quite a feat to smart out the talk with Miss Mabel. As expected of your highness, but are you sure about it? Miss Elian was hoping you'd be the prince, wasn't she? Elian was Felix's distant relative whom Felix's grandfather, Duke Crockford, was considering her to be his official fiancé. But Felix shrugged lightly, not caring deep down what he felt. Ignoring one of the three most beautiful ladies in the school, what an enviable situation is this, things that he hadn't intended, leaked out in a murmur as he looked down at his list. It's not because Felix disliked having his potential fiancé prepared by Duke Crockford. He just has no interest in them. Thinking about it, the things that Duke Crockford prepared were always things that he had no interest in. Whether it was his fiancé candidate or the bright future that laid unfold by before him. All the things that were prepared for Felix Ark Riddle, he had no interest in them. Regardless what I've become, I must become a king. No matter if they call him Duke Crockford's puppet or not. Comma I can't let Duke Crockford's puppet, be king, Casey spoke in a strained voice. 
The absence of her usual vivacious smile on her face, replaced by dark despair emitted in her eyes. With a slight tinge of sadness in her despair, Casey pointed the tip of her thin knife at Monica. Finally, she had understood. The reason Casey had toppled down the lumber in the East Warehouse and caused an accident she had staged on was to create an alibi. If two incidents occurred on the same day in two different places, most people would assume that both incidents were the work of the same person who wanted to assassinate Felix. So, by getting involved in one of the cases, she can avoid the suspicion of the people from her surrounding. If the toppled woods had succeeded to cause Casey injuries, no one would think that Casey was the culprit. But why do you have to do such dangerous things? One wrong move and she would have been crushed to death by the wood. Casey's desperate attempt to walk the tightrope sent a chill down Monica's spine. Casey, why did you have to go that far? Why did Casey have to go that far to take Felix's life? She went as far as carrying dangerous magic tools. Even faking an accident on purpose to create an alibi. To Monica's bewilderment, Casey laughed wryly, her face turning to despair. If His Highness Felix becomes the next king, Duke Crockford, who stands behind him, will start a war with the Randall Kingdom. As the Duke's puppet, His Highness Felix will not be able to stop him, the Kingdom of Randall. The birthplace of the first prince's mother, was a small country situated between the kingdom of Riddle and the empire. Felix told her when they drank the chocolate together. He said that the first prince faction had strong ties to the Randall kingdom. But Felix didn't say what kind of sentiments the second prince faction had for Randall. My hometown is bordered by the Randall kingdom. It's always been hard for us because of all the damage caused by the dragons. But since we didn't have enough money, we can't rely on the other nobles, the Dragon Knights, who work directly under the king, would take a while to arrive. Asking for help from neighboring nobles to send their military power always cost an enormous fortune. Some of them, such as the Count of Kerbeck, able to provide military support to neighboring nobles, but with a cost. And to maintain an army need an enormous amount of money. Comma we had neither soldiers nor money. After all, our people and land had been exhausted from fighting the dragon. And the one who had helped us was the Randall Kingdom. For many generations, our family has been in contact with Randall Kingdom. We had brought those people, the night they had dispatched, to cross the border of the kingdom to help our hometown, of course bringing in the knights from the Randall Kingdom that dispatched secretly crossing the border of the kingdom was against the regulations between nations. But for Casey and the others who lived in fear of the dragon, it would have been a blessing. The kingdom's dragon knights were always dispatched to places that got the highest priority. It's not hard to imagine that the remote countryside with few financial resources was put on the back burner. No wonder Casey felt so much more indebted to the Randall Kingdom than to her kingdom and neighboring nobles who would not help them. His Highness Felix's maternal grandfather, Duke Crockford, had been planning to initiate a war against Randall. Since the Duke has his sights set on the Empire, he intends to use Randall as a stepping stone, the knife glinted ominously in Casey's hand. The knife with its mirror-like polished surface showed Monica's frightened figure. Casey said to Monica with a dark smile. Do you think I would let them do that? Of course not. Whether it's Duke Crockford or his puppet, the second prince, is that why you set up, Quang Flame, to assassinate him, the, Quang Flame, was a magic tool made for the purpose of assassination. Its size was about the size of a brooch that fits in the palm. Once activated. It will absorb the mana of its surroundings to store it inside, and when the accumulated mana has reached a certain amount, it will burst the flames out. The name, Quang Flame, came from the fact that flames would rotate at high speed like a screw, piercing through the target. What makes it unique was its high killing power. The flame of the, Quang Flame, can easily penetrate ordinary defensive barriers and leave the target full of holes. The disadvantage of this tool was its limited effective range. The, 
Quan Flame was very powerful, but it had a narrow range. But what if it exploded in the warehouse where the gunpowder was stored? There would undoubtedly bring tremendous damage. The thoughts made Monica paled, then Casey spoke. I don't know how did you know about the Quonk Flame. I wish you hadn't known about it, if so, I wouldn't have to make a move to silence you. After Casey regained her grip on the knife, she closed the distance in an instant, aiming to slash Monica's neck. However, Nero stopped her attempt by grabbing Casey's arm and held her down. He then twisted her arm and yelled. Hey, Monica. This is no time to dawdle. We've got to do something with the West Warehouse. Various conflicts swirled in Monica's mind. Casey's words in despair caused Monica's thoughts to fray. And the only person who could resolve this situation was Monica. If Monica doesn't do anything, a lot of people are going to die. Although the area of effect of the Quang Flame was narrow, there was no doubt that if the fireworks ignited, it would cause a huge catastrophe. The costumes for this year's play will be really amazing. After all, I supervised them myself, so you should watch the play, it was what Lana told to Monica. I don't want it to be ruined. Monica slowly raised her head and reached out to Casey, who was struggling against Nero's grip on her arm. Then, without chanting, a weak electric current flowed through into Casey's body, causing her strength to weaken, allowing the knife to slip from her hand. What was that? Casey probably had no idea what was going on. After all, the spell that Monica cast didn't use chant. Although Casey hadn't lost consciousness yet, since she was unable to move her numb body, she can't do anything but slump down. After that, Nero carried her body lightly on his shoulder before glaring at Monica. Hey, that current tingled me as well, you know, ignoring Nero's complaint. Monica pondered on how to overcome the situation. Should I use a voice amplification spell to alert the entire school to evacuate? No, I can't. My words are not convincing enough for everyone to believe me. How about using a wind spell to send only the Quang Flame into the sky? No, it's a stationary magic tool, so it will be attached to the wall or floor. And since it has the property of absorbing the surrounding mana, if I am not careful, it will explode the moment I cast my spell. As expected, the best option would be to trap the Quang Flame inside a barrier to suppress its flames. Since Monica can use remote spells, she can set up a barrier just at the right distance from her location. The problem was the strength of the barrier. The Quang Flame has enough destructive power to penetrate most barriers. If I put all my magical power into it, I can reduce the strength of the Quang Flame, but that won't be enough. If I don't completely block it out, it will ignite the fireworks and cause a huge disaster, unless I can create a barrier as powerful as Lois. At that moment, an idea crossed Monica's mind like a revelation. Monica rushed over to the window and focused her mind. Oh, what are you planning? Nero was looking at Monica with great interest. Monica then spoke to Nero. Nero, I'm going to attack the academy. What, didn't I tell you before? When this school is attacked from the outside, Lewis's defensive barrier will be activated. I want you to find out where the source of the spell when the barrier is activated. Without waiting for Nero's reply, Monica created several powerful wind spear spells without chant. Fundamentally, offensive spells usually generate around the caster before it flies towards the target. However, Monica used a higher level of remote spells to create wind spears outside the academy grounds to attack the academy with them. This academy has a large protective barrier set up by Lewis Miller of Barrier Magician. When Monica unleashed her wind spears, Lewis's barrier had recognized it as an attack from the outside and immediately wrapped the entire school in a protective wall. The powerful barrier easily repelled Monica's wind spears. As expected of the barrier that had needed, Barrier Magician, to set up for years. It has incomparable strength. Nero. 
Where is the source of the spell? It's close from here. Oh, I think it's at the old garden. Bring me there. In which Nero replied lightly with, right away, as Casey was carried on his left shoulder, he had to carry Monica on the other shoulder. With that, Nero lightly jumped over the window frame and started running towards the old garden. As Nero was running at the speed which made it hard to believe that he was carrying two people at the same time, he asked Monica. So, what are you planning to do once you find out the spell location of that devil magician's barrier? I'm going to borrow Lewis's barrier, ha. Huh? I'm going to rewrite Lewis's defensive barrier to contain that, Quang Flame. At Monica's words, Nero blinked his golden eyes and looked at Monica. Is that, even possible? I've never done it before, so I don't know, but I have to do it. Squeezing her shaky hands, Monica said to herself. After all, I am the, silent witch. V6 C11, being who comes from the depths of silence as Earth GT Silent Witch July 7th. 2021 8 minutes Casey Groove had three older brothers, all of whom went off to slay dragons and never returned. Her eldest brother was grabbed by a wyvern and dropped from a high place. He died instantly from a broken neck. Her second brother was torn apart by the claws of the red dragon, and his corpse returned with missing limbs. Her third brother was burned to death by the red dragon's fire breath. He was buried in his armor unable to remove his helmet and armor that melted into his seared skin. Every time a dragon threat occurred, her father would request the kingdom to send out the dragon knights over and over again. However, they rarely arrived in time. Casey's hometown, Bright, was a barren land of little importance to the Riddle Kingdom. That's why the central nobles haven't paid any regard to it. In fact, the more dragons there are in this land near the border, the less likely it is to be attacked by neighboring countries. Some even said that dragons were more useful than weak nobles as a line of defense, regardless of the people who lived in the land. After the dragon ravaged their land and took away their family, Casey and his family were on the brink of despair, but then the knights from the Randall Kingdom came to their rescue. They rushed to the Bright Territory in secret and struggled hard to exterminate the dragon. Casey's grandmother has a tie with the Marcus family of the Randall Kingdom, apparently, because of that connection, they had rushed over to help. One can imagine how grateful Casey and the others were for that support when their country had abandoned them. Since then, Casey's father, Count Bright, and the noble of Randall have been in secret contact with each other exchanging information about the situation in their countries. One topic that often came up was Duke Crockford. This man, the second prince's maternal grandfather and the most influential man in the Riddle Kingdom had his eyes set on war with the Empire, and he apparently wanted to invade Randall as a stepping stone to that goal. If the second prince became the next king at this rate, that nightmare would become a reality. Comma is there anything I can do? He told Casey with a pained expression on his face. Kama you should go to Serendia Academy. If she could catch Felix's eye and cajole him, that would be the best. But if that's not possible, Kama use this. His father gave Casey a small magic tool to use, the Quonk Flame. What's going on? Casey was confused as she was carried on the shoulder of the dark-haired man. This Nero guy who was wearing a school uniform even though he was clearly at the age of a person who would attend school, was strange, but what even stranger was Monica? It was surprising that Monica knew about the existence of the, Quang Flame, but when she also said that she would neutralize it was even more so. That's not possible. Casey's father had told her how powerful the, Quang Flame, was. The downside of the, Quang Flame was its narrow effective range and its low accuracy. That's why she set it off at the moment when Felix was present for the bringing in of the fireworks. Even if the, Quang Flame, didn't hit Felix directly, the damage caused by fireworks should kill him for sure. The man known as Nero easily jumped over the old garden gate and proceeded to the inner part. Since this old garden untended, it was covered full of weeds. 
At the center of the garden lies an old fountain. Climbing down from narrow shoulders, Monica ran over to the fountain and peered into it. The now unused fountain was filled with puddles of rainwater and was covered with moss. This fountain has a magic formula carved into at the bottom. It was a large-scale barrier that protected the academy. Monica also squinted at the decorative carvings on the outside of the fountain. There's another layer of protective barrier around the large-scale barrier, probably to keep the barrier from being destroyed. He added another layer of protective barrier around the large-scale barrier. In other words, if you don't deal with the outer protective barrier, you can't tamper with the main large-scale barrier, right? So what are you going to do? In response to the dark-haired man's words, Monica declared in a voice without a hint of hesitation. I'll only break the outer protective barrier. Casey became more and more confused, wondering what Monica was talking about. She might be a novice when it came to spells, but she could tell that what Monica was talking about was not something anyone could do. Monica stood in front of the fountain and focused her concentration. What she needed to do now was really simple. First, destroy the protective barrier that covers the outside of the fountain. Next, rewrite the formula of the large-scale barrier inside the fountain so it can be used against the Quonk Flame. The outer protective barrier, which was triggered by any attempt to touch the inner large-scale barrier, was extremely strong and would not be destroyed by ordinary spells. If so, Monica will only have to destroy it with all the power she has. Monica closed her eyes and quickly weaved a magic formula. This magic formula was a very high-level spell that only a few people in the kingdom have mastered. Even Monica, who's got no chanting skill, needs more than 10 seconds to complete it. Once Monica completed her spell, she would only say the last chant out of awe and respect for the one she was about to summon. Come answer my call, O King of the Shapeless Guidance, show me a glimpse of your power. At that moment, the rustling of all the trees stopped. The wind calmed, the sound died away, and a white tower appeared above Monica's head. Casey peeled her eyes open and Nero whistled merrily, You sure did it flashy, in the name of Monica Everett of the Seven Sages. Open the gate. I call upon you from the depths of silence. Sheffield, King of the Wind Spirits. In Felix's breast pocket, Will was restless. Apparently, he was trying to tell him something. Felix left the area a little bit after giving a word to Elliot and hid behind a tree. Well, what's the matter? I apologize for interrupting your student council duties. The white lizard peeked its head out of Felix's pocket and looked around restlessly. When Felix saw that Will was not acting normally, he asked again, Will which made him look up at Felix and said, Come our gate to summon the spirit king has been opened somewhere around here. Are you saying someone used the spirit king summoning spell? Yes. I believe this presence is Lord Sheffield, the spirit king of the wind. At Will's words, Felix put his hand on his chin and pondered. In the Riddle Kingdom, there were less than ten people who had made a contract with a high-ranking spirit. In addition, only about half of them could summon a spirit king. Could one of the seven sages be nearby? If it's the one who specializes in wind magic, could it be Lewis Miller of the Barrier Magician? Summoning the Spirit King was not a simple matter. It meant that a major battle or something similar was going on. However, there was no clamor or destruction to be heard in the surroundings. Well, be vigilant in the surrounding area for a while. Once I'm done with the loading, we'll take a look around the school. Understood, with one nod. The white lizard went back into Felix's pocket. Monica could only keep the door to the Spirit King open for less than three seconds. But it's enough to break a single barrier. Destroy it, as if in response to her voice, a sharp blade of wind swung down from the gate. It was as if a huge machete had been wielded, and countless cracks appeared in the protective barrier around the fountain. As the wind subsided and the gate closed, what left was the clearly shattered outer frame of the fountain. Comma what, was that? And just now, what do you mean, 
by the seven sages. Casey, who was being carried on narrow shoulders, groaned in a shaky voice. Without even glancing back at Casey, Monica climbed over the debris on the outer frame of the fountain and headed inside. Comma you're not the only one who's hiding something, Casey, that was all Monica could say at the moment. For now, there was still work to be done. Once the outer barrier has been destroyed, the next thing to do is to rewrite the main barrier, the large-scale defensive barrier that has been placed over the entire school. The barrier magic formula engraved on the bottom of the fountain was so wonderful that Monica couldn't help but exhale in admiration. As expected of a barrier that Lewis Miller of the Barrier Magician took his time to create. The delicate technique of constructing the barrier was similar to that of a first-class architectural technique. In a different sense, Lewis was also a great genius like Monica. Although he has a bad personality, it's got multiple entire right dummy formulas installed, but first, I need to disable them. Monica. Mana in the West Warehouse is going bad. It's on the verge of bursting, right now. Monica couldn't even hear Nero's voice. Her eyes were filled with complex and difficult magic formulas. Monica deciphered them as if she were solving a mathematical equation. Dummy formula analysis complete. Specify the coordinates of the barrier. Change the barrier activation condition from attack from outside to attack from inside. Limit to anti-fire attribute. Prevent the incoming oxygen. All that remains is to compress, compress, compress. Things that occurred now were not something flashy spell like the Spirit King summoning, but a plain and silent battle. After fully grasping Lewis's protective barrier, Monica compressed it from one that protected the entire school to one that covered the Quonk Flame. Since the Quonk Flame was the size of a palm, the barrier needs to be compressed into extremely small. Then, the Quonk Flame, secretly set up under the shelves of the West Warehouse exploded. The Quonk-like flames explode as if countless springs, packed to the very limit, were released all at once. Normally. The flames would have pierced the nearest person, ignited the fireworks, and wreaked havoc on everything it passed, but they were held back by the tiny barrier. Normally, barriers were designed to allow oxygen and other substances necessary to sustain human life. However, Monica purposely set up the barrier to prevent oxygen from passing through. It's the same logic as putting a lid on an oil lamp to extinguish it. The Quang flame that had lost its oxygen within the barrier quickly disappeared as if the intensity of the flame had been a lie. Eventually, when she was sure the fire had completely extinguished, Monica let out a breath of relief. Comma neutralizing the Quang flame, complete, after saying that, Monica flopped down on the spot. Having summoned the Spirit King and rewrite the formula of the large barrier, Monica's mana was at its lowest point. As Nero walked over to the fountain, he said to Casey, who was dumbfounded on his shoulder as if he's boasting. How is that? My master is awesome, right? V6 C12, the bargaining Monica Azareth GT Silent Witch July 9, 2021 9 minutes Manikria. Are you Ali Eve? Monica, who has turned her body over in the fountain, responded in a faint voice in her heavy breath. Comma some, how, wow, that's amazing. You've drained almost all of your mana, yeah, I haven't, used this amount of mana, in a long time. Speaking of her combat style, Monica usually used minimum consumption of mana to shoot enemies down with precise control. However, in order to destroy the barrier created by Lewis Miller, she had no choice but to use the most powerful spell she could use. Summoning the Spirit King had cost 70 to 80 percent of Monica's total mana. It's not something that can be used casually. Right now, she just wanted to let this exhaustion take over and fall asleep, but she still had things to do. Comma I guess it was my loss, on Nero's shoulder, Casey smiled helplessly. Casey, Monica slowly raised her heavy body to look up at Casey. 
Casey looked neither hateful nor angry, only smiling sadly as if he had given up on everything. Why do you look like that? I was the bad guy who's deceived you. The only reason Casey had been so nice to Monica was to get closer to Felix. And it had worked well. Because of that, she was able to find out the schedules that the student council planned. That's how Monica had been taken advantage of by Casey. Comma even so, Monica squeezed the bosom of her dress and began to frantically ring out her voice. You are the person who had invited me, whenever it was eating lunch or visiting elective courses, and it makes me happy, even if her reason was to take advantage of Monica, she still couldn't hate Casey. The girl who put the fried fish in bread, then ate it cheerfully as if tasted so delicious. The girl who would casually mediate Claudia and Lana when they got into a fight. The girl who said that she was good at embroidery then spread out a beautifully embroidered handkerchief, only to smile bashfully. Comma please don't look at me like that, Monica. Casey closed her eyes and shook her head gently. I was the evildoer who tried to kill his highness. You should properly hate me for that. To what extent Casey's behavior was an act? Monica had no idea. Still, she didn't think all of that was a lie. After had attempted the assassination of the royal family, Casey and her family would end up being executed. Comma executed. Monica felt a chill run down her spine. At that moment, Nero looked up at the sky and clicked his tongue. Hey, Monica. There's a bad guy coming here. I'll be hiding over there, you hear me. Nero placed Casey, who was still too numb to move, down on the ground and quickly running away. Perhaps he tried to disguise himself as a cat behind a tree. She knew that sooner or later since she had messed with the barrier without permission, that person would come. Although Monica was staggering on her foot, she still stood firm and looked up at the sky. Far away in the sky, a small black dot could be seen. It was approaching her way at a tremendous speed. Did he even think about his landing? Had a bad feeling, Monica took a few steps backward. Then, just a few seconds later, two figures fell from the sky, spinning wildly as if they were going to pierce the ground. One of the figures, a beautiful woman in a mage uniform, spun around at high speed in an upright position and landed at a point where she was buried knee-deep in the ground. On the other hand, the other figure behind her swung his staff and lifted his body just in time to avoid being buried into the ground. Die on you, stupid maid. Didn't I tell you to fix that way of your landing? I named it the rotating landing method. It is highly offensive and very stylish. There is no such thing as stylish when you're buried knee deep in the ground, you damned maid. Lewis Miller of the Barrier Magician. The man with braided chestnut hair with monocle, clicked his tongue loudly and stared down at Monica. Then he put his finger between his eyebrows and let out a deep sigh. I thought my barrier was in trouble, so I came to see what was going on. It was you, after all, my colleague. I it's been a while, Louis. After Monica bowed her head, Louis bent over to look into Monica's face, giving her a quizzical look. Kama you've almost drained all of your mana? This is the first time I've seen you like this. Even when you've finished killing more than 20 wyverns hadn't made you in this state. Louis squinted his pale purple eyes behind his monocle and looked alternately at the destroyed fountain and the slumped down Casey. Now, young lady over there, I take it you're a student at this school. Are you an enemy or an ally? When Monica clammed up, Casey said it with a casual tone. I am an enemy. A foolish enemy who tried to assassinate His Highness Felix, but failed, I see. Lynn, restrain her. After Louis gave his order, the beautiful woman in the maid uniform pulled her buried knee out of the ground and restrained Casey by her hands behind her back. Casey did not give any resistance as she meekly did what was told. Now, my colleague. Can you explain the situation? A. Quang Flame was set up in the west warehouse where the fireworks were being brought in, Lewis frowned at the words of the, Quonk Flame. He, too, fully understood how terrifying that magic tool was. 
Not to mention the terrifying sight if those fireworks were burning nearby. Dot. I figured my defensive barrier wouldn't be able to completely defend against it, so I borrowed your barrier, Louis. I am sure I had put up a decently sturdy protective barrier to cover the large-scale barrier. I summoned the Spirit King to destroy it. I am sure I also had filled out the large-scale barrier themselves with dummy formulas to prevent anyone from tampering. Um, actually, I'm pretty good at detecting such things. Ah, but it took me almost a minute to spot those dummies. It's true, a minute? All of those things, you only took a minute. Monica's words made Lewis's face twitch. He was silent for a while with a sunken face, but then he grunted with a bitter face. Comma if there are any incidents in the future where my barriers get altered, I will suspect you first and foremost. Yeah, I'm telling you it's not something anyone can do. How could I believe that? Damn it. Monica thought she heard a very disturbing muttering at the end, but she pretended not to have heard it. Despite his refined demeanor, Lewis Miller was a rather dangerous man. I understand the situation in general. Anyway, the second prince hasn't found out about your true identity yet, has he? Yes, he still doesn't know. I think, very well. In that case, I will collect the, Quang Flame, for in your stead in secret. We will also take custody of that young lady. As for you. I'll have you continue to guard the second prince, W-8. Monica raised her voice to interrupt Lewis's words. What is it, C. Casey? What will happen to her? We'll have her interrogated, and drag out every single person involved in the assassination. If she refuses to talk, we'll probably have to use some kind of mind-involving spells. The use of spells to coerce a person into confessing or getting their mind to obey was strictly forbidden. However, under certain conditions, such methods were permitted if it was used for the interrogation of violent criminals. But Monica knew. She knew that mind-involving spells could cause serious damage to the mind of the subject. In the worst case, she would become a vegetable. Lewis could guess by Monica's complexion what she was trying to say but he just gave her a cold look. Comma you seem reluctant to have her interrogated using mind-involving spells. But, she might be happier if she becomes a vegetable. When it comes to the attempt assassination of royalty, an execution is inevitable. It's better to be executed while she's losing her mind, so she doesn't have to suffer. Casey's face paled quickly. Monica gulped down the spit in her mouth and braced her trembling body to look straight up at Louis. L. Louis, you're in the First Prince faction, aren't you? That's a bit out of the blue, what is it? Please, answer me. Louis looked at Monica's face probingly with his cunning eyes. The, silent witch, who usually turned her head away immediately, was now looking straight up at Louis. This fact caught Louis's interest suddenly. Yes, you're right. I'm a schoolmate of First Prince Lionel. I guess you could say that I am a member of the First Prince's faction. However, please don't misunderstand me. It is not that I want the First Prince to be the king no matter what. A. Eh? Monica was expecting that he was going to say, His Highness Lionel is the most suitable person to be the next king, but to hear it different from what she thought was a bit of a letdown. I call myself a member of the First Prince's faction is because I don't like Duke Crockford and the Second Prince, it was a very Lewis-like reason. But the fact remained that Lewis was a friend of the First Prince. After confirming this fact, Monica made her next move. See Casey has ties to the Randall Kingdom, who is also the part of the First Prince's faction, Lewis's eyebrows twitched. If the truth that the First Prince's faction which is connected to the Randall Kingdom, plotted to assassinate the second prince is revealed, it will be a huge disadvantage for the first prince's faction, right, just by having the truth of the attempted assassination of the second prince was revealed, the first prince's camp will be at an overwhelming disadvantage. When Monica pointed this out, Louis gave a thin smile. I never thought I'd see the day when you... A person who doesn't care about political struggles, 
would make a deal like that with me. How clever of you. Neither His Highness Felix nor anyone else knows about the assassination attempt. The only people who know about this were Casey and I. So you want me to pretend that assassination attempt itself never happened? She didn't expect it to be considered never happened. Monica only wanted to prevent Casey's execution. As Monica desperately persisted, Lewis said in an admonishing tone, The First Prince's faction is not entirely united. Both the First Prince and his mother are, let's say, not interested in the throne. They would prefer to use fair methods than an attempt assassination, but not everyone who supports the First Prince is like that. Cutting off his words, Lewis glared at Casey with cold eyes. Fools who do unnecessary things like assassinating the second prince will be erased in secret. B but, there should have been another way to handle things up in secret. Monica bit her lip tightly and stared at Lewis with tears in her eyes. At this moment, Lewis Miller was secretly calculating. For Lewis, it would be better to cast a mind-involving spell on Casey to make her confess the name of the extremist group before erasing her in secret so there would be no loose ends. But if he did that, he would probably not be able to get Monica's cooperation in the future. The strength of Monica Everett of the Silent Witch was far greater than she herself realized. It would be a shame to lose her cooperation. After weighing all the factors, Lewis came to a conclusion. If the young lady confesses to everything honestly, I will promise not to use mind-involving spells. She shall be sent to a convent. Never again be allowed to appear in social situations. That was the best compromise he could make. In response, Monica bowed deeply to Louis. Thank you, Louis. In return, you will have to continue cooperating with the mission to protect the second prince. Yes, Monica nodded without hesitation, and Louis narrowed his eyes behind his monocle. One of the reasons Louis chose Monica to be the second prince's bodyguard was Monica's distrust of people. A person who trusts others so easily will not be able to serve as a guard. Comma don't let yourself get too attached. A. Louis put his index finger on Monica's brow and looked into her face. Remember, you are one of the seven sages, Monica Everett of the Silent Witch and Monica Norton of the Student of Serendia Academy is your temporary identity, Monica's shoulders jerked. Comma don't ever forget that, why yeah, when Monica nodded, Lewis stared down at her with a glint in his eye. Lynn, who had been watching the scene in silence, had a strange thought like, this seems like that of child abduction. V6 C13, Soft Wall Azeroth GT Silent Witch July 11th. 2021 7 minutes Lynn, escort that young lady to the magic course post nearby. Just mention my name, and they should offer you a room, at Lewis's instruction. Lynn, who had restrained Casey, nodded curtly. Certainly. Then, what about you, Master Lewis? I need to deal with this barely intact barrier, said Lewis as he pointed a destroyed fountain with his chin. The barrier that Monica borrowed has been rewritten for use against the Quang Flame, which was unable to protect the entire school anymore. He can't leave it as is, after all. Monica shrank back apologetically, and Casey, who was looking at her behavior, opening her mouth. Monica, that word made Monica's shoulders jerked. She understood that this was going to be her last meeting with Casey. Casey would never be able to attend a ball or come back to this school again. But Monica was stumped, looking at Casey with a lost look on her face not knowing whether to say sorry or goodbye. Casey was smiling with her eyebrows lowered as usual. As if the G's word could be heard from that smile. Monica, I'm not going to say sorry or thank you. I was your enemy who had attempted to assassinate the second prince, I'm not your friend after all, so, please don't look at me like that, for the first time, Monica felt like her heart had been gripped so hard, her nose tingled, her eyes were welled up, eventually, a sniff escaped from her lips, and a drop fell from the corner of her eye, you shouldn't cry over your enemies, be but, 
Sniff what a soft-hearted seven sages you are. If you keep on like that, someone will take advantage of you someday. The exasperated tone was that of the usual Casey, caring and attentive. You should have to hate me properly. If you can't do that, please forget about me. And no, Monica shook her head in frustration. Comma I have a good memory. So I will never, ever, forget you. What a troublesome seven sages you are. Casey was laughing, felt perplexed at her words. As Monica was weeping and snotting bitterly, Casey turned her eyes to Lynn and said, You can take me now. Lynn gave a small nod, and as soon as she did, a wind barrier wrapped Lynn's and Casey's bodies. It was some kind of flight spell that probably cast continuously until reaching the destination. Afterward, their bodies softly flowed up. Monica was looking up at Casey with tears streaming down her face. But Casey didn't turn her face back. Instead, she kept looking at her front, before leaving a few words. Goodbye, Monica. It was not the words addressed to Monica as the Seven Sages, but to the ordinary Monica. Eventually, Casey's figure was becoming more and more distant. While Monica kept gazing up at the sky even until their figure was out of sight, Louis muttered to himself as he cleared the debris from the fountain. You should learn how to control your emotions in moderation. I'm not good at that kind of thing. Then, just treat it as another people's problem. Louis was the only one who could do it without hesitation. As Monica was sniffling snottily, Louis got up, pushed a clean handkerchief into Monica's face roughly and went back to the fountain. Because of a certain magician, I am busy repairing the now broken barrier. If you don't want to help me, just go somewhere else. You can leave that young lady to us, we'll take care of it somehow. What about this handkerchief? It's a precious gift from my wife. Don't forget to wash and iron it before you return it, okay? In response to typical Lewis behavior, Monica blew her nose before laughing bitterly. After staying for a while so to let her red and eyes become a little less swollen, Monica headed back for the student council room. Although her eyes were still a little red, Monica always kept her face downcast, so unless one looked closely, it would be hard to notice. Due to her empty mana, she was unable to walk straight, but she dragged her heavy body to the student council room and opened its door. She saw all the members beside herself were already there. It's probably because all the duties to oversee the delivery were done. As Monica was struggling to decide what kind of words to say, Felix turned his gaze to Monica in concern. Cyril told me the logs were collapsed. Are you and your friend all right? Why yes, we don't get any wound, all right. In that case, since there are no further duties today, we should end our activities today. Well then. I'll excuse myself first, I have some personal matters to deal with, Monica patted her chest in relief. Since her mana was almost empty, standing was all that she could. Ugh. My head is all fuzzy. While Monica was struggling to keep her consciousness together, Neil looked at her with concern. Um, are you okay, Miss Norton? Yeesh, why a reply says the otherwise, though. All the other student council members were starting to get ready to leave. Felix had left after said he had something to do, and Bridget was heading back to her dormitory after him. As for Cyril, he needed to stay behind since he had to make sure the door was locked. While Elliot was glancing at Monica, but quickly turned away and left the room. It's been so long since I ran out of mana, my sense was almost... Anyway... I have to get out of the room so as not to interfere with the locking of the door, so thought Monica absent-mindedly as she moved her heavy feet. Then, suddenly, she bumped into something. It was too soft for a wall. Comma hey, somehow she heard a voice above her head. But more than that, Monica exhaled in comfort. The wall she leaned against made her regain her mana a little bit. M. Miss Norton. Miss Norton. Neil was shaking Monica's shoulders in a panic. When Monica muddle-headedly raised her gaze up, her eyes met Cyril's. In fact, it was Cyril Ashley's back that Monica was leaning against. 
I I I I I I I I I'm sorry. I I'm a little spaced out, and then, Monica remembered. Cyril Ashley has a constitution that allowed him to accumulate mana easily. That's why he used a brooch-shaped magic tool to release excess mana from his body. In other words, Cyril's surroundings had a slightly higher concentration of mana than most. Apparently, Monica's body, which was out of mana, was approaching Cyril, who had a lot of mana, on its own, in search of mana. I will be scolded for this, I will definitely be yelled at. Monica squeezed her eyes shut in preparation for the angry voice, but she didn't hear Cyril shouting for any length of time. As she peered up at him fearfully, Cyril's brow wrinkled, his mouth curved into line, and he had a complicated look on his face. Come Lord Cyril, Cyril was hesitant to say anything, but eventually, he bowed his head vigorously with an expression of anguish. Both Monica and Neil, who were standing beside him, were shocked by his behavior. I'm sorry, Cyril apologized to Monica. Monica was baffled. Perhaps, she thought, his apology was not intended to me but to Neil, but Cyril's body was definitely facing Monica. Cyril was apologizing to Monica. Um, Lord Cyril, please raise your head. Wh why are you apologizing to me? I was so preoccupied with checking the number of items brought in and did not check how well the rope was tied up. That accident was my mistake, B but, Cyril has done nothing wrong. It was Casey who had cut the rope in the first place. However, since Monica covered up for Casey, that accident ended up being Cyril's carelessness. Was it because of me all of this became Lord Cyril's fault? As soon as she realized this, the blood drained from Monica's body. Her mind was jumbled with so many emotions that she couldn't think clearly. Come but, Lord Cyril. You have done, nothing wrong, the moment she said it out loud, the tears that were supposed to have receded began to overflow she couldn't stop crying, as if her tear glands had burst. Along with that came weeping and sniffling. Come you wa a sniff, you wa a. Cyril and Neil were flustered when Monica suddenly started crying. H. Hey, Treasurer Norton, Miss Norton, um, p p p p please calm yourself. Even when Cyril and Neil tried to calm her, Monica's tears wouldn't stop. Kama Sawi, you are. Sniff I'm, Sui why I I. Monica slumped down on the spot and sniffed gaggingly. They were not tears of sorrow, but tears of guilt. I'm sorry for deceiving all of you. I'm sorry for telling you so many lies. While crouching down, she kept crying and crying, and eventually, Monica's consciousness fell into darkness. Comma did she falls asleep. I, I guess she was tired after all that crying. Monica was snoozing in her sleep with a terrible face full of tears. Cyril and Neil looked at each other, completely at a loss. Comma so. What did you call me here for? The face of Claudia Ashley, who had been called into the student council room, was gloomier than usual, and now she was staring at her brother who was laying Monica down on the sofa. After that, Cyril said in an awkward manner, Please bring Treasurer Monica to her dormitory when she wakes up. We can't just bring her to the girls' dormitory, can we? I'm not your servant. His sister's harsh words made Cyril choke up while Neil looked up at Claudia with a troubled face. Um, can I ask you? Miss Claudia, please, that's nothing. Monica and I are best friends, after all. It's only natural to help your best friend get to her dorm. Cyril's cheeks twitched at the sudden change of heart, but he swallowed his anger when he saw Monica sleeping peacefully on the couch before dropping his own jacket over her. V6 C14 Feeling similar to Love Azareth GT Silent Witch July 13, 2021 Five minutes after leaving the student council room, Felix made sure no one was around before poking his finger in his breast pocket. After the white lizard will poked his head out of his pocket, Felix spoke in hushed tones, keeping a wary eye on his surroundings. Earlier, you said that the Spirit King was had been summoned, yes. 
I felt a gate for summoning the Spirit King being opened in this vicinity. Okay, then sneak into the teacher's room and see if there's been any talk of it among them. No matter how much of a student council president he was, it would seem unnatural for him to be entering the teacher's room without proper reason. Then, entrusting it to Will, who can invade discreetly, would be the right choice. What are you going to do, Your Highness? I am going to take a look around, to see if there's anything out of the ordinary, understood. If you encounter any problems, please summon me immediately. Will crawled out of Felix's pocket, then slithered down before moving quickly through the hallway to the staff room. After Felix saw him off, he went outside the school building himself. Since he hadn't mastered a sensing spell, he had to rely on his intuition to look something amiss, but there was one place he really wanted to check first. Comma it was the old garden. The place where he met Monica for the first time. Felix was aware that the fountain in the old garden contained a large-scale barrier that protected the entire academy. In fact, he went out of his way to duplicate the key to the old garden, because he was interested in its magic formula. The magic formula in the large-scale barrier that Lewis Miller of the Barrier Magician, one of the Seven Sages created was, a work of art even to the amateur eye. Such complex and elaborate magic formulas were not something one can see very often. And if there was an emergency situation where the Spirit King had to be summoned, or there was an attack on the school from the outside, the barrier should have been activated. In any case, it would be a good idea to check the barrier first. With that in mind, Felix headed for the old garden and took out the key he had secretly duplicated earlier to open the door. Come to think of it, I forgot to ask how that little squirrel managed to slip through this door. Maybe there was another secret passage that only Monica knew about. As Felix walked forward, thinking about this, he felt a person's presence ahead of him, so he stopped in his tracks. Horizontal ellipsis. There's someone near the fountain? He then crouched behind the tree to hide his presence before peeking out toward the fountain and saw a man in a robe working on something in there. The one working on it was a young man with chestnut hair in a braid wearing a monocle. Felix was familiar with his face. Horizontal ellipsis. Lewis Miller of the Barrier Magician? Why is he here? If he was going to do a regular inspection on the barrier, he should have contacted the school beforehand. But Felix has not heard of such notice. Another thing that bothered him was the outer frame of the fountain, which was broken into pieces. The outer frame of the fountain is supposed to have a barrier that protects the large-scale barrier, and it's broken? What sort of situation is this? Lewis was inside the fountain, chanting repeatedly, seemingly adjusting the barrier. Then a strong wind softly sweeps over the area, bringing a young woman in a maid uniform down from the sky. He had heard that Lewis Miller had made a contract with a high rank wind spirit. Perhaps that woman was the one. Master Lewis, I've completed the escort, all right. Then, go retrieve the remains of the Quang Flame from the West Warehouse. Wow, you sure like to use your spirit roughly. I can't keep my hands off this one. This barrier. I almost had to rebuild it from scratch. I know it was used to neutralize the Quang flame, but that's pretty reckless, Felix frowned upon hearing this conversation. He had heard of the term, Quang flame, before. It was the name of an assassination tool with extremely high killing power. That thing was placed in the West Warehouse? Not long ago, it was none other than Felix who was in the West Warehouse. From their conversation, someone had attempted to kill me, and Lewis Miller secretly protect me. I suppose? However, from the way Lewis described it, he didn't seem to be the one who neutralized the Quonk flame. Then, who was it? Felix held his breath to focus on the conversation between Lewis and that woman. Lewis looked down at the fountain with a weary face before letting out a sigh. This fountain can't be fixed anymore. Well, the Academy will probably just think it's broken over time. But to summon the Spirit King just for the sake of protecting the second prince, 
Lewis ruffled his neatly trimmed chestnut hair and blurted out. Lady, silent witch, is being reckless, really, what? Felix's heart jumped at the name that came out of Lewis's mouth. Silent witch, summoned the spirit king? To protect me? A scene from a few months ago came back to Felix's mind. A flock of wyverns shot through the eyebrows. Their huge bodies fluttering down silently like snow. That magic was so quiet and beautiful. And now, it's Wielder, Silent Witch, summoned the Spirit King? To protect Felix? Looks like it's the truth. Felix's heart raced in excitement as if he were a young child discovering the existence of a shooting star for the first time. How majestic and beautiful would be the sight of that beautiful magician summoning the Spirit King? Was, Silent Witch, still nearby? Did she just happen to be passing by? Or has she been infiltrating the school for some time? From what I've seen of her at the ceremony, she's a small figure, but, wait, that alone can't determine that she's a woman. The, Thorns Witch, one of the Seven Sages, also bears witch in his title, but that person is a man, and it might be possible that the, Silent Witch, is also a man. Then, there's also a chance that she's infiltrated into the middle grade section. No, she could have infiltrated as a teacher as well. Wait, calm yourself. She might not have been infiltrated, but just happened to be passing by. Unlike any other time, he felt his thoughts running ahead of him. That's how much Felix admired the, silent witch. I want to see her. I want to meet her. I want to see her use her no-chant magic, if only once. Felix couldn't help but press his hand to the upturned corner of his mouth. He heaved a huge breath as he pressing down his mouth with his palm, he felt his cheeks flush in a way that was uncharacteristic of him. That was just like a little boy who is searching for his first love. I might have finally found it. Felix squeezed his chest, which was throbbing, over his uniform. Something I am truly interested in. Characters Introduction 3 Azeroth GT Silent Witch July 15, 2021 3 minutes appear characters until now format, name, age. Monica Everett, 17, Silent Witch, the youngest of the seven sages, she goes by the name Monica Norton while undercover. She has recently discovered the delicious taste of fish cuisine. Fish is delicious. Nero, undetermined, Monica's familiar, a black cat. He has recently gained an ability to wear a school uniform but is unaware that his appearance, mid-twenties, makes it looks out of place. Student Council members Felix Ark Riddle, 18, second prince of the Riddle Kingdom. Student Council President of Sarandia Academy. His maternal grandfather was Duke Crockford. He pretends not to be interested in magic but is actually a secret fan of, Silent Witch. Cyril Ashley, 18, he is the, adopted, eldest son of Marcus Hyen, Ice Spells user, and has sworn allegiance to Felix. He's got a hidden sweet tooth and loves chocolate. He and his sister do not get along very well. Bridget Graham, 18, Marquis of Shelbury. Secretary of the Student Council. A talented woman with high self-esteem. Felix's childhood friend. Elliot Howard, 18, the eldest son of Count Durs V. Secretary of the Student Council. Cheerful and frivolous. A young man who is obsessed with his status. Good at chess. Neil Clay Maywood, 17, eldest son of Baron Maywood. General Affairs Manager of the Student Council. He has a quiet and reserved personality. His taboo word is a shorty. Born from the mediator's family and believes in thoroughly finding out for himself what he doesn't know. Other characters in the Academy Lana Kalit, 17, she's Baron's daughter. Her father is a wealthy merchant and is well versed in fashion. Monica's classmate. Her academic grades are average, but she knows a lot of things. Claudia Ashley, 17, the daughter of Marcus Hyen. Cyril's adopted sister. Noelle's fiancé. 
She pretends to have a bad personality because she doesn't want to be dependent on by others, but she likely has a bad personality by nature. Glenn Dudley, 17, a new student who transferred in at the same time as Monica, an apprentice magician, seems to have a dangerous master. His staple food is meat. His favorite type of woman is a cool older woman. Casey Groove, 17, the daughter of Count Bright. A very caring older sister. Feeling indebted to the Randall Kingdom, she devised a plan to assassinate Felix in order to thwart the ambitions of Duke Crockford, who wants to start a war with the Randall Kingdom. Isabel Norton, 16, the daughter of Count Kerbeck. A collaborator of Monica's who pretends to be a villainess. She is from a family that has been confronting dragons for a long time, so she's got extraordinary guts. Agatha, 19, Isabel's chambermaid. She always gets excited about romance novels with Isabel. A talented maid who is attentive to details. In fact, she is quite proficient in using a spear. Teacher group teacher Lindsay Pale, 26, female ballroom dance teacher. Currently looking for a wonderful husband. The third daughter of a Viscount family whose ideals were a little too high and thus missed out on her timing to marry. Professor Macrigan, 69, practical magic teacher. He calls others Chu. He used to teach at Minerva, a training magician institute. Professor Boyd, 45, chess class teacher. A robust skinhead man. His appearance would be more suited to wielding a weapon on a battlefield but he comes from a fairly good family. A Marcus family. Other characters will, late 20, Felix is Chamberlain and can take the form of a lizard. He feels it would be inconvenient if anyone other than Felix knew of his existence. Lewis Miller, 27, one of the seven sages, barrier magician. He is one of the best martial artists in the kingdom but he actually lost to Monica in the Magic Battle of the Seven Sages selection. Rosalie Miller, 27, Lewis' wife. Military doctor. Currently pregnant. She is aware of her poor taste in men. Lindbergh Field, undetermined, she is a high-ranking wind spirit who has a contract with Lewis. A beautiful woman in a mage uniform. Her latest passions are calculating Pythagoras numbers and developing a stylish landing method. Extra Story 3, The Girl Who Ran Away to the World of Numbers Azareth GT Silent Witch July 17, 2021 Four minutes for some period of time, Monica had forgotten how to understand human speech. When her father died, her uncle took her in, and Monica lived in fear of him every day. Her uncle hated Monica's father, no, you could say he loathed him. Whenever her uncle spoke ill of her father, Monica desperately tried to refute him. It wasn't my father's fault, she said. So every time Monica opened her mouth, her uncle would throw his fist at her. Shut up! Stop talking nonsense! His fists would swing down along with his curses. In the worst cases, she would get kicked in the stomach and beaten with a chair. Sometimes meals were taken away from her, which was not uncommon. Whenever she went out, people in town would talk behind her back. All they wished for was how bad her father was. Her mind and body were slowly being worn down little by little. Gradually, Monica found herself escaping into the world of numbers when times were tough. When her uncle beat her, or when she was forced into the barn in the middle of winter, Monica would just repeat in her head the formulas from the books she read in her father's study. In this way, she can forget the pain in her body in the cold of winter. After some time of escaping into the world of numbers, Monica's perception began to become distorted. At first, she couldn't recognize people's faces anymore. The size of the eyes, the width of each eye. The angle of the corners of the eyes, the length, width, and height of the nose, the angle of the chin, she can recognize these in numbers, but she cannot recognize them as a human face. To Monica, a person's face was nothing but a mass of numbers. Next, she could no longer recognize human expressions. When her uncle got angry, 
His eyebrows would move this much. His mouth would open this much. The angle of his mouth would change by this many degrees. His eyebrows would move this many times in three seconds. Everything would be converted into numbers. However, Monica could not recognize the anger that her uncle's face meant. All Monica could understand was the number of how many parts of his face had moved. Her uncle had kicked the desk, and the desk moved this much, so the amount of force needed to move, and so on as her mind began to calculate the numbers. But Monica couldn't understand why her uncle had kicked the desk. All Monica could understand was the numerical value of the force needed of the kick desk. By the end of it, she couldn't recognize human speech. She could understand what her uncle was saying, but her mind could not perceive the meaning of his words. Since she can't understand what was being said, Monica combined the number of sounds into a mathematical equation, calculated it, and let the result leak out of her mouth. When his uncle saw Monica mumbling those numbers, he kicked her, saying she was creepy. Not recognizing what had been said to her, Monica calculated how many seconds it would take for her nosebleed to coagulate. And so, by the time a year had passed since her uncle took her in, Monica had become so broken that she could not recognize anything but numbers. She simply immersed herself in the world of beautiful formulas that never hurt her, turned her eyes away from reality. Her body grew to the point where it was barely able to survive, and her originally thin body became as thin as a stick. In such a situation, a woman reached out to Monica. She was Hilda Everett, a mid-thirties woman in glasses with short auburn hair who used to be her father's assistant. I've been looking for you ever since Dr. Rain died, Hilda said in a calm voice as she covered Monica, who was freezing after being kicked out of the house by her uncle, with her own scarf. But Monica can't perceive those words. All she could understand were the numbers. As she muttered the exact number of letters of the words she had heard and applied them to the equation, Hilda smiled softly and stroked Monica's cheek. So Dr. Wayne had taught you the formulas, and at your age, you're already so proficient on it, you don't deserve to be here. Come with me, Monica, Monica, when was the last time someone called me by my first name wondered Monica at that word. After all, her uncle never called her by name but Trash or Dimwit. She hadn't heard his father's name in a long time, since everyone had treated it as a taboo to be spoken. Her own name, her father's name, brought Monica's consciousness, which had been wandering in the world of numbers, to the surface. Come in my name, the name my dad gave me. Monica Rain, Hilda hugged the bruised and battered Monica, looking like she was about to cry. Dr. Rain would be very sad to see you like this, Dad. 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 That person didn't punch or kick her when she uttered the word Dad. She just mourned her father's death and hugged Monica affectionately. That brought her so much happiness. My dad wasn't wrong. My dad was. My dad was. I know. Dr. Rain was an outstanding man. My father was burned. And all of his study. All of them. As Monica's body quivered, Hilda's arms tightened around her body. That alone was enough to convey how sad this woman was over the death of her father. Sniff sniff your wah -ah -ah -ah. Dot. Monica cried aloud for the first time in a long time in Hilda's arms. That scene was like that of a whimpering young child. The next day, Monica became the adopted daughter of Hilda Everett, a researcher at the Magic Institute who later discovered her talent for magic and sent her to Magician Training Institute Minerva. And this story took place about five years ago when Monica was still 12 years old. Extra Story 4, Barney Jones Azareth GT Silent Witch July 19, 2021 13 minutes. Barney Jones was the second son of Count Anvard, a historic and prominent family in the southwestern part of the Riddle Kingdom. In noble society, the second son or younger was always treated as a spare for his older brother. No matter how incompetent or stupid the older brother was, he will always be the one to inherit the family. Barney was aware that he was better than his brother. And, in reality, he was like that. After all, 
His grades and academics were good enough to impress his tutor, and above all, he had a talent for magic. However, the one who would inherit the family was not him of the second son, but his older brother. That was why he enrolled in Minerva, the best institute for training magicians. What he was aiming for was not just an advanced magician level, but the seven sages, the peak magician in the Riddle Kingdom. Once he became one of the seven sages, he will receive the title of Count Magician, which was equivalent to the rank of Count. It was a very high rank that grants you to have an audience with the king. That way, even Barney as the second son, would have a chance to prove his achievements to his father and brother. So Barney studied hard, and thanks to his hard work, he was ranked first in both classroom and practical skills. I'm not like my brother. I have my talents. He believed that even if he was the second son, he could find his own path to success. It was when Barney was 13 years old. When he returned from the study tour, he found one female student surrounded by several male students in the corner of the classroom. A recently enrolled female student named Monica Everett, a.k.a. the Mute Everett. She was a petite girl with a doll-like expressionless face, always silent and downcast. Apparently, the boys were intrigued by Monica's inability to speak and were trying to toy with her. They were excited to see who could make Monica talk. One of the boys picked up a spider from the windowsill and brought it close to Monica's face. Monica remained downcast and did not react at all. Hey, pry this guy's mouth open. I'm gonna shove this in her mouth. I bet she'd scream if I did. In response to the boy's voice, the other boys reached for Monica's face, but those hands were pulled back just before they could. The boy's cuffs were burning with puffs of smoke. Ah, uh, WH what is this? What are you planning to do with her? The boys clicked their tongues blatantly when Barney said coldly, after unleashing his fire spell we're in the good part. Don't interrupt us, honor student, your behavior is so unbecoming of a noble. You should be ashamed of yourself, the boys snapped when he said this while lifting the rim of his trademark glasses. But Barney didn't hesitate to use a shortened chant, quick spell, and surrounded the boys with flaming arrows. The boys backed away with the winds, and Barney snickered at them. Do you really think you can beat a guy like me who's the best in practical skills? Barney was the sole genius in his grade who had mastered shortened chant. In the magic match, the speed of chanting plays a vital role. Therefore, no one could compete with Barney, who had mastered it. The boys clicked their tongues and walked out of the classroom. Barney snapped his fingers to dispel the flaming arrows and turned his eyes to Monica. Can you stand? Monica was staring blankly at the floor with her olive eyes. Out of the corner of her eye, she saw the spider that the boys had thrown. Eventually, as the spider began to scurry and escape out the window, Monica raised her eyes blankly to Barney. Thank you. Despite her awkward speech, the mute effort seems to be able to speak properly. Secretly surprised by this, Monica continued with her words that were difficult to ignore. Comma for seven, that Sprider, wait a minute, why did it become like that? He did not do that to save the spider, but Monica. He involuntarily squinted through his glasses to glare at Monica. Unfortunately, I hate bugs. So, what I saved was not a spider, but you. Monica blinked slowly in response and tilted her head to the side. She pondered for a while as if searching for words, and then started to speak slowly. I'm not afraid of spiders, ha. Huh? Monica's face remained expressionless as she mumbled to an astonished Barney. Upon looking at her again, he was struck by how expressionless she was. Her face was plain and simple, and if she smiled, she might be as charming as anyone else. But other than the occasional blink, her face hardly moved at all. Monica was silent with a blank expression, but eventually, she spoke in a whisper, hardly moving her mouth. Comma but I'm glad, that you saved, the spider. Because it would have been, pitiful, if it had gone into my mouth. What kind of logic is that? 
Monica nodded without expression when Bernie expressed his dismay. Bernie scratched his cheek and asked a question that was bothering him. The way of you speak sounds so awkward. Did you come from another kingdom? Monica shook her head with a blank expression. Apparently, she was not a foreigner. I am sorry. I've been practicing speaking with my adoptive mother, but her words trailed off before taking a deep breath. It was as if a person who had forgotten how to speak had remembered how to breathe. I hadn't spoken for a long time, so I couldn't speak fluently. She hadn't been speaking for a long time, which meant there must be circumstances behind it. Looking at her pale face and body, which was too thin compared to Barney, who was the same age as her, he could somehow guess that her circumstances had been harsh in their own way. Barney bent down in front of Monica and reached out his hand. Can you stand? Monica widened her eyes and looked at Barney's hands. Then, she hastily squeezed the pocket of her uniform. Um, I don't have a lot of money. Barney's cheeks twitched. Please don't look down on me. I'm a proud member of the Jones family. I would never extort money from you. Barney grabbed Monica's hand to help her to her feet, but she was still somewhat dazed, looked like a doll that had just been pulled by a puppeteer. Her eyes rounded slightly when Barney brushed the dust off Monica's robe. It was a very slight change in expression. However, he was strangely happy to see the change in the expression of this doll-like girl. You really are quite a handful, aren't you? I'm sorry. You should be thankful for that. No, when Barney said that, Monica's lips moved slightly, murmuring. It was too subtle to be called a smile, but the corners of her mouth were certainly lifted just a little bit. Comma thank you. You're welcome. From that day on, Barney began to look after Monica in any way he could. Monica was a real klutz, falling down in the middle of nowhere, getting her hair all shaggy, losing her personal belongings all the time. She simply couldn't take care of herself. Academically, she was as good as Barney at magic formulas and anything involving numbers, but her grades in general education were abysmal. Especially in history and languages. It was devastating. I guess it can't be helped, so said Barney, opening his notes before giving her explanation, and Monica thanked Barney in a hushed voice in response. In this way, as they studied together every day, Monica's speech gradually became more fluent and her facial expressions became more expressive. Whenever she got in trouble, Monica would cry out to Bernie with her eyebrows downcast, and when he fixed her shaggy hair, she would give him a smile like a blooming wildflower. He was the one who had changed Monica. Barney felt some pride in it. Comma thanks, Barney, 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 help me e, you're incredible, Barney. Those little words of Monica's always fill Barney's pride. While the truth, he's got a faintly conscious from it. When Monica's hair was messy, it was because her classmates had cut it by force. When her personal belongings went missing, it was because they were being hidden. Nevertheless, Barney averted his eyes from this fact and continued to take care of Monica. Surely he subconsciously hoped that Monica would isolate herself. Because the more isolated Monica got, the more she relied on him. That way, he could continue to be a dependable honor student. While Minerva, an institution for training magicians, taught practical spells as a matter of course, the students were forbidden to actually use spells during the first six months of their enrollment. A spell was a powerful weapon that could wreak havoc if used in the wrong way. That's why it took at least six months to learn the fundamentals before moving on to practical training. Barney has been attending Minerva since he was seven years old, and by the time he was thirteen, he had mastered all of the intermediate spells and was able to use some of the advanced spells as well. Above all, he was the only person in his grade who had mastered shortened chant. Therefore, in practical training, he was unbeatable. Monica, on the other hand, has only been in school for a short time and has only recently begun to learn the basics. 
Barney was convinced that Monica's understanding of magic formulas was so high that once she learned how to manipulate Mana, she would catch up with him in no time. However, in her first practical class, how long aren't you going to stand still? Even though the teacher urged her to do so, Monica only turned pale and quivered her lips. Eventually, the class ended without her even being able to chant, let alone use a spell. When recess came, Barney closed in on Monica. What the hell was that? Didn't you get the theory perfectly, B but, I was too scared, to speak out in front of so many people. Then Barney finally remembered. Monica was now able to speak more normally in front of him, but she still couldn't talk to other people. I'm really scared when I speak in front of people. I'm scared that people will look at me the moment I say something. I'm scared of their stares. If you keep saying things like that, you won't be able to use magic no matter how long it takes. I know. Monica hung her head down with teary eyes. She must be really frustrated. After all, Barney had seen next to her how diligently she had studied for the past six months. I would like to do something about it, he thought, and a good idea came to his mind. Right, if you're bad at speaking up in front of people, you just have to reduce your chanting. A, I'll teach you shortened chant. With it, you could cut the chanting time in half, since it would be easier on you. Right, at Barney's suggestion, Monica fidgeted, kneading her fingers, letting her gaze wander. But, do you think I can do it? I'm sure you can do it. I know how much you've studied the fundamentals, and I'm sure you'll be able to understand the shortened chant in no time. When Barney said this in an unusually passionate tone, Monica's cheeks flushed red in response, and she nodded her head. I'll do my best. Ha <laughs> he, you really can be depended, Barney, HMPH, of course. After all, I am the man who will become the seven sages in the future said Barney as he puffed out his chest and Monica smilingly nodded in response. Yet, I'm sure you can become one of the seven sages. You're an amazing person, after all, Monica's naive admiration tickled Barney's heart. He thought his path to a bright future was clear. And Barney never doubted that. Yet, for now. In the classroom of the practical class, a gasp filled the air. Everyone was speechless watching the scene in front of them as if they were glued to it. This was an unprecedented feat that no one in this room had ever seen before, no chance spell. This was done by the girl who had failed the practical test the most. Monica Everett. What is this? I didn't know any of this. Monica raised one hand lightly, and a small whirlwind erupted, spiraling around and around. Throughout all of this, Monica's mouth remained shut. I never taught her any of this. Barney was stunned. The only thing he had taught Monica was how to shorten the chant. When they were alone, Monica was able to use shortened chant, and he assumed she would demonstrate it in this class. If she demonstrated the shortened chant, the people around her would surely look at her differently. If she did, Barney was going to proudly say that he was the one who taught Monica. But the scene that was happening in front of his eyes was more than just a shortened chant. This time, when Monica lifted her other arm, an arrow of ice was created. Again, without chant. She could also use other spells without chanting, even if it wasn't her favorite attribute, wind. She had enrolled in Minerva six months ago. And it had only been two weeks since she started her practical class. Monica Everett was a true genius in a realm that could not be reached through hard work alone. That fact was drowning Barney with despair. While Monica looked at him with admiration, Barney felt deep anger and jealousy. If Barney hadn't been there, she wouldn't have been able to have a proper conversation if Barney hadn't been there, she'd be all alone in class if Barney hadn't been there, she'd hardly be able to do anything. Feeling terribly betrayed. Barney gritted his teeth with his eyes staggered with jealousy behind the glasses. From the moment Monica demonstrated her no-chance spell, the environment around her changed drastically. She was treated as a scholarship student and became a pupil of Professor Gideon Rutherford, 
one of Minerva's most distinguished professors. It was well known that most people who had studied under Professor Rutherford had been chosen as the Seven Sages. Rumored that Monica would eventually become one of them. Monica was now under the direct supervision of Professor Rutherford and rarely showed up for regular classes. This naturally meant that she had fewer opportunities to see Barney. Since the day Monica used her no chance spell, Barney has not spoken to Monica even once. On several occasions, Monica had tried to talk to him, but Barney had ignored them all. Barney's idea of a perfect future started to go haywire little by little from that time on. To shorten the distance between him and Monica, Barney trained tirelessly, but as a result, he suffered from mana poisoning and ended up in the infirmary. Struggling as the mana consumed his body, Barney felt so much hatred toward Monica. The reason why he was suffering so much was all because of Monica. Because of Monica, he has become this crazy. It's all Monica's fault. Comma Monica had ruined Barney's life. In the winter of her 15th year, Monica was chosen as one of the Seven Sages. The fact that the youngest of the Seven Sages had been chosen from Minerva's students caused much excitement in the academy. Especially on the day of the inauguration of the Seven Sages and its parade, the whole academy was in an uproar. But all the cheering and praise for Monica was just irritating noises to Barney. He believed that even Barney, his brother Spare, would be recognized by the people around him if he mastered magic and became the Seven Sages. Barney never doubted that he could become one. But the person chosen as one of the Seven Sages was not Barney, but Monica. He was not even invited to the selection process. Barney, a voice called out to him when he was leaving Minerva's library. The person who was running up to him was Monica. Now that she was one of the seven sages, she can no longer be called a student of this school. She was wearing an indigo robe that only the seven sages were allowed to wear. The beautiful staff in her hand was also something that only the seven sages were allowed to hold. Monica hugged her staff to her chest and fidgeted with her fingers. Her childish gestures, her body that was too thin for her age, and her young face were no different from the Monica that Barney knew. But she was no longer Barney's friend. The, mute Everett, had become the, silent witch, of the Seven Sages. Um, F for a long time. I really want to thank you, Barney, Monica was stammering, trying her best to speak. But Barney coldly interrupted her. Are you mocking me? The, Monica's expression froze. Oh, what a wonderful feeling is this thought him as he wanted to distort that face even more. You want to thank me? Ha ha, is that sarcasm? You must have been looking down on me, right, huh? W-I would I? No, I would never. I just thought that you were an important friend of mine, you're not my friend. Monica's eyes were wide open, and tears were slowly welling up in them. Feels hurt more, he thought. Monica should have gone to pieces, so shredded and tattered that she would never be able to recover again. You must be a detestable person to come all the way to see me in the formal attire of the Seven Sages. Does it make you feel good to make fun of me and look down on me like that? Hey, tell me, Miss Seven Sage, a teardrop falls from Monica's eye. Monica's nose turned red before she cried like a child. That miserable crying face, that crying voice, filled the hole inside Barney's heart just a little bit. What a shameful way to behave for one of the seven sages. Though, I don't consider you to be one of them. You'd be better off holed up in an isolated mountain cabin. Monica was slumped there, sobbing. Barney walked past her quickly, heading for his room. The pitiful cries that reached his ears made him feel better, if only slightly. After that incident, Barney never heard any more about the activities of the Silent Witch. Rumor has it that the Silent Witch lives a hermit-like life in a mountain cabin. Probably would never see Barney again. This is for the better. Thus, Barney Jones finally regained his peace of mind.